full range of municipal services to more than 1 million people who live in the unincorporated areas of LA County, as well as services to residents of cities that contract with the county to provide some services for a fee. And that's a quick look at LA County at your service. You can learn more about what the county does for you at ceo.lacounty.gov slash budget. Okay, Gio, thank you very much. That worked out for us. Much appreciated. Awesome. Thank you for the feedback. Oh, yes.
like to call your attention to my foolproof Rubik's Cube on my shelf. Do you, do you see it? All the squares are green. So no matter where you turn it, you've won. Just <laughs> Did you do that yourself? Did you do that yourself? No. Oh. Oh, wow. It was, it was a gift from an admirer for the level of my IQ. <laughs> wow. It's all green. That's funny. I get it. <laughs> Isn't that good? <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, I just yeah. won. <laughs> That's funny. You know, just a little funny before we start. What can I say? Well, green is the color. The color of money. Oops. Mm. Didn't even think about that. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a really good play yesterday at the taper, which I recommend. So anyway, time to start. Talk to you later. Happy Monday and good morning, everyone. Welcome to the LA County Board of Supervisors special meeting for fiscal year 22-23 budget deliberations. And today is Monday, June 27th. Let's take roll to confirm attendance. Supervisor Solis. Present. Good morning, Supervisor Kuhl. Good morning, here. Supervisor Hahn. Here. Supervisor Barger. Here. Thesia Davenport, Chief Executive Officer. Present. Don Harrison, Acting County Counsel. Present. Celia Zavala, Executive Officer of the Board. Here. Thanks, everyone. Today, we'll begin with opening remarks from the Chief Executive Officer and members of the Board, and then we'll take public comment. The Chief Executive Officer will then present each of the budget items in numerical order. We'll now hear from Ms. Davenport. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning, Board of Supervisors. Today marks the budget deliberations phase of the county budget process. This represents your board's opportunity to consider what are called final changes to the recommended budget you approved in April. Before I share a brief slide presentation, I would like to start off by showing a short animated video. This is the latest in our series of explainer videos that aim to make our budget process more accessible to the public. This one is called LA County at Your Service. It's a 90 second overview of some of the many services LA County provides to our 10 million residents. Based on feedback some of your offices received from constituents during community listening sessions regarding the budget, we thought it might be helpful to provide a basic explanation of what the county does and what the county does not do. We have also created a longer version of this video that goes into more detail about the county's role relative to our 88 cities and say some of our local school districts. We hope both versions will be useful in promoting greater public understanding of the county's budget process and the services we provide. Can we please cue the video? LA County is the nation's largest municipal government. Led by our Board of Supervisors, we have more than 100,000 employees at your service. Sometimes you see us in action, fighting a fire, performing an ocean rescue, providing vaccinations, picking up a stray dog, or helping to check out a library book. And sometimes our services are only visible to those who receive them, like benefits that keep food on the table or mental health care that calms a crisis. Whether high profile or low key, county services touch the lives of more than 10 million residents. Here's how. As the public safety net for the entire county, we provide certain essential services for everyone, whether they live in one of the county's 88 cities or one of our many unincorporated areas. The county also provides a full range of municipal services to more than 1 million people who live in the unincorporated areas of LA County, as well as services to residents of cities that contract with the county to provide some services for a fee. 
And that's a quick look at LA County at your service. You can learn more about what the county does for you at ceo.lacounty.gov slash budget. Okay, uh, thank you. And so we will now uh, move into uh, the presentation. I just wanted to point out supervisors that that video as well as a, a longer version, it's probably about uh, three to four minutes long that goes into a little more details. You know, for example, like our incorporated areas versus our cities, that's also available on the website at www.ceo.lacounty.gov slash budget. Uh, we have the slide presentation, and so I will um, go to the next slide, please. So budget basics, uh, each time I give this presentation, I like to do some level setting about our budget. Uh, this, um, someone is not muted, um, but I'll go ahead and continue. In this budget phase, the county's budget will grow to $39.7 billion which is an increase of about $1.2 billion from the recommended budget in April. I will discuss this in a little more detail later, but the important point here is that the $1.2 billion does not represent unallocated revenue. The county's workforce as demonstrated on the slide will also grow to 112,614 budgeted positions which is an increase of 1,063 positions from the recommended budget in April. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about that number, uh, the $1.2 billion growth between recommended budget and today, the final changes budget. You'll see on the screen some of the multiple sources of the growth in the county's budget since I first represented the, presented the recommended budget in April. More than a third of the increase is approximately $448 million change resulting from reclassifying one Mental Health Services Act reserve account to multiple reserve accounts. This accounting change increased the budget on paper but provides no additional funding for programs. Next, there's $370 million, which represents an increase in state federal and other outside funding sources, which as you know, are typically tied to particular programs or services. Also, there's $269 million, which reflects anticipated year end savings from the current fiscal year that can be used as one time funding source in carryover for the fiscal year into the fiscal year 22-23 budget. There's an $18 million increase based on a projected property uh, increase in tax property tax revenues generated specifically for the fire department. There's $15 million uh, is a projected increases in local sales tax and higher than anticipated state sales taxes. And finally, $38 million relates to a variety of what we call ministerial changes. I'll take the next slide, please. So what's new in this budget, budget phase? Here's how we are proposing to deploy that additional funding and the new positions. As you know, we will be standing up three new departments by July 1st with a fourth on the way this fall. The three departments are identified on the screen. This is a very complicated undertaking and we are recommending funding to set up the administrative infrastructure that will be needed to successfully launch these new departments. To support our ongoing commitment to ending homelessness, the homelessness crisis, we are incorporating $489.3 million in Measure H funding, plus another $82.3 million in state homeless housing assistance and prevention dollars to support a new framework and streamline homeless initiative strategies. We're also investing in our VSAP election system as we head into the November election. 
supporting this state-of-the-art technology to ensure that we offer the greatest possible level of voter access and convenience. And we are adding some necessary positions to support key functions across the county. More than half of the newly budgeted positions are aimed at increasing public services, including 491 new budgeted positions for the Department of Public Social Services to implement revised eligibility rules and to resume processing Medi-Cal renewals once the public health emergency ends. The Departments of Health Services, Mental Health, and Public Health will also benefit from more positions as well as increased funding for programs ranging from the Access Center Emotional Support Hotline to expanded eye care. And additional positions are allocated to the Sheriff's Department. Many of these new positions will ensure public accountability and transparency through compliance with the Public Records Act. Other positions will support two training academies to help offset vacancies and train a new generation of deputies to serve the public. I'll take the next slide, please. Our economic outlook. We continue to be cautiously optimistic. We believe this growth in overall spending is warranted based on projected increases in local sales taxes, as well as higher than anticipated state sales tax and vehicle license fees. Based on a generally optimistic outlook, we have maintained our earlier projection in the recommended budget for 6% growth in local property taxes. However, as you'll see on the next slide, we're also in a period of rising uncertainty and intensifying pressures on the budget. I'll take the next slide, please. <clears throat> so just a little bit about pressure points. While our short-term outlook remains generally positive, we know that even the best forecasting can't conclusively predict the future. Here are some of the known pressures we're facing. First, we have some economic uncertainty caused by the current economic environment, which poses a number of significant risks, including higher interest rates combined with inflationary pricing and therefore the potential for a recession. Next, the continuing pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic continues to pose a public health and economic threat with high case rates due to the highly infectious new Omicron variant. Mandates from other levels of government. We expect increased costs this year due to higher rates and projected enrollments in state and federal entitlement programs. To name just a few examples, we will need to absorb higher costs for foster care, adoptions, the general leave program, in-home supportive services, and more. As we look forward, new programs like the CARE Court program may create similar pressures for more services without additional funding, creating hard choices and trade-offs that could affect our existing programs. We also have to think about our legal obligations. These include our current consent decrees, and compliance with them, as well as other potential costly litigation that we know is on the horizon. Labor, we are very pleased to have reached tentative agreements with bargaining units representing the majority of our represented employees and negotiations are continuing with the remaining units. Investing in our value workforce is important, but it also adds significantly to our bottom line. We expect these agreements to add a sizable amount to the county's obligations over the next three-year term of new contracts when all negotiations are completed. And finally, structural deficits. As you are aware, we must also continue our work to address structural deficits in several departments and programs. And those include the Office of Diversion and Reentry, the Office of Violence Prevention, the Parks After Dark program, and the Department of Children and Family Services. We also have some structural deficits in some of our special district departments with their own dedicated revenue, like the county library, where the shortfall is due in some measure to cities not paying the actual cost of our services, and in the fire department, which is in need of additional special district revenue. 
Taken together, these pressures are a flashing yellow light telling us that we should proceed cautiously and intentionally so we can achieve your board's ambitious policy goals. Like all governments, we must balance these very important policy goals with our obligation to remain fiscally responsible. I'll take the next slide, please. <clears throat> Just a few points on priorities. Our budget is large, but not unlimited. As you know, most of our funding is dedicated to fulfilling our legally mandated responsibilities and carrying out the nine board directed priorities and other initiatives. Led by your board, we are continuing our longstanding tradition of fiscal retraint and working hard to ensure that we are placing our limited funding where the public need is greatest. We're also working to bring an equity lens to our decision making. It all adds up to a constant effort to prioritize the priorities and invest wherever we can in the work that is already underway, work that is on the immediate horizon, our work that has readily available resources to support it. Unfortunately, that means saying no or not yet sometimes to some promising programs. We've had to turn down all but the most pressing requests for new program programming or program expansion with a total of $242 million in funding requests being deferred in this budget phase to the supplemental changes budget phase. This means that if there were not a single additional request for funding between now and the supplemental budget in October, my office will manage in disposition $242 million in funding requests over the next few months. But this is also where our multi-phase budget process works in our favor because we have multiple opportunities to add, subtract, pivot, adjust, and otherwise make course corrections. The county is engaged in transformative change on many fronts all at once, all aiming to solve, not just manage, long-standing problems. We want to create lasting change in underinvested communities and in the lives of underserved residents. Multiple competing priorities are reality for all of our departments engaged in this work. So when we say prioritize the priorities, it describes a constant process of assessment and evaluation to determine whether a new funding source is readily available and also the level of urgency and feasibility relative to other priorities. More specifically, we must collect data on, analyze, and consider multiple factors. Some I've just mentioned, but others are, we consider whether requests are mandated by law or a court order. In these less than ideal settings, the, pro the priority is imposed upon us. Other factors include whether there is a sense of urgency. Is there available funding source or are matching opportunities available? Is the program or initiative at the design and planning phase or is it shovel ready? Are there outstanding issues related to labor or personnel? Can the program or initiative staff up in a timely manner? Does the program or initiative have a structural deficit such that the program expansion draws the fiscal cliff nearer and into sharper focus? Does the program or initiative represent a longstanding request that is now ripe and can only be funded with net county costs. These factors provide just a glimpse into this analysis, an analysis which is then further complicated by the volume of requests that must be considered all in a very short period of time. We must also think about whether our staffing meets the needs of our residents as those needs change. For example, the CEO continues to move forward with an analysis of the probation department staffing ratio, the purpose of which is to right size the juvenile camps, halls, and field operations to the appropriate staffing level, given the reduction in the juvenile population. However, we also want to be sure to account for the, trans the transition of responsibility for secured, secured youth treatment facilities from the state to counties given the closure of the state's Division of Juvenile Justice. The CEO anticipates providing detailed findings, recommendations, and results of our analysis 
including but not limited to any cost savings to the board this fall. At this point, the budget adjustments before you today represent the result of our comprehensive and ongoing analysis of the board's priorities and fully allocates available resources under our latest projections. It's worth noting that the $1.2 billion growth in the budget does not represent unallocated money. It comes almost entirely from restricted or one-time funding sources, which essentially precludes us from embarking on new ongoing initiatives or programs with this funding. I'll take the next slide, please. Just as a reminder, even though the board will be deliberating and considering final changes to the recommended budget today, we are a long way from the end of our annual budget journey. The next steps include upcoming recommendations for allocating $975 million in phase two American Rescue Plan Act funding, the year two spending plan for $100 million in care first and community investment funding, and presentation of the supplemental budget on October 4th, which will wrap up our annual budget process. I'll take the next slide, please. This concludes my presentation, supervisors. As always, I'd like to thank your board and your vision and leadership and to salute your staffs, especially the budget deputies for their assistance and partnership throughout the budget process. <clears throat> Ms. Davenport, thank you very much um, for the presentation and for the video. Uh, I hope that um, we'll have the opportunity to link to our own websites, the videos, because I think as we um, continue to help you get information out to the county as a whole and all of our constituents about the complexities of the budget process, it certainly helps us through the process. And so again, let me thank you for your presentation and really the hard work uh, your budget team, as well as all of our budget deputies, have put into this process. As you said, the process is far from over, um, but I look forward to continuing the conversation. My two uh, favorite, if you will, slides today were your pressure points and your prioritize the priorities. Those are the two I'm going to pull out and, and keep in my binder um, because I think they reflect a couple of things that are important for us to keep in mind. Um, the role you play in, in monitoring and, and your ability to report back to us the fact that we do have a healthy economic outlook, but I appreciate your ongoing analysis, which is critical for a budget and a county this size. Um, it's also important as we talk about um, how we operationalize making our budget process more transparent really like many local governments, not only across this state, but the country, who are coming up with unique ways to engage the community in community-based budgeting processes. Um, I think if we are more uh, overt in that work, we um, engage the community, we bring the community into the process, we can avoid what I call ballot box budgeting, which often ties the hands of policymakers in terms of really creating budgets that reflect the new and emerging needs of our community. So making sure that we continue to refine our processes to better utilize data and evidence to inform the budget process, uh, I think is important, particularly as we talk about equity-based budgeting, as you mentioned, and I appreciate that. Um, I hope that we continue to identify equitable outcome measures to assist um, on how we meet, how our budget meets the needs of our communities. Um, and it's really going to be important that we establish strategies to comprehensively engage the community in this process. I'm clear that we five are the elected and the budget is ultimately our responsibility. But I think if we figure out ways to better engage the community, educate and inform the community about the budget process, it will lead to a better outcome and our constituents feeling that they've been um, heard. A lot of good things funded in this budget, um, uh, many of which you mentioned. I just want to highlight that uh, it includes additional resources um, to expand our homeless initiative and the summer community programs. Uh, I look forward to uh, our ongoing work to stand up these new county departments 
with new and refreshed visions. Um, really appreciate the partnership. Um, and thank you, Supervisor Solis, with your help uh, on the digital divide issue. And I appreciate and want to thank ISD for the way that they have relentlessly championed this issue. And I'm glad to see an additional two and a half million to support accelerating um, digital equity in this budget. Uh, I, I'd hope to see more full-time positions there, um, but appreciate that this is ongoing work. And again, our effort to recover with equity is really important. Again, the additional departments we're standing up, Aging and Disabilities Department, Department of um, Economic Opportunity, Again, hoping additional staff, because as we know, at the local level of government, it's people who get the work done. So while we are standing up the infrastructure, uh, making sure that we've got people in those seats to move that agenda forward is important. And that certainly includes the Department of Youth Development. Um, glad to see that its creation is included in the final changes budget, um, but there's substantial growth that will be needed before the department is ready to thrive and make a lasting impact on the lives of our youth, and that will require resources to get that done. As we talk about resources and staffing um, and prioritizing the priorities, I'm really hoping that we continue, as this board has done courageously, to prioritize our care first, um, jails last culture and orientation and while there are additional resources allotted to the sheriff, I certainly hope that uh, that department does and steps up and does a better job of managing their budget, um, aligning their um, budget priorities with the culture set forward by the board, and that those additional positions will indeed be used to increase transparency in that department. As you said, um, Madam CEO, we've got a long way to go um, through this budget process, and I hope that um, our departments also understood the prioritize and the priorities <laughs> slide and figure out and help work collaboratively with you and us to make sure that we're delivering services to our residents who most need them. Again, operationalizing equity. You know, I, this. Friday a week ago was, of course, Juneteenth, and we held a celebration in the 2nd District. And to see 1,200 county residents come forward to access county services was very telling to me. Um, I think that as we go forward, I hope the county departments understand that sometimes we have to step outside of the box of perhaps our own offices to meet people where they are, mental health, public health, um, public defender. Um, it was shocking to see the number of people who really came out because they needed access and support from their county government. We have the infrastructure and hopefully again through this budget process um, and our effort to prioritize equity investments, we will ultimately get there. So again, I think the current budget process and allocation of resources, again, requires an ongoing deeper look to ensure that resources are indeed being allocated equitably throughout the county. Uh, I will continue to advocate for that. Uh, and as we move forward um, in this budget process, look forward to continuing the conversation, continuing to monitor our own economic health as a county, and making sure that we're meeting the needs, um, prioritizing the priorities, I'm gonna use that uh, phrase a lot, Ms. Davenport, because I understand its value, and I understand the role that this five-member board has in making sure that we set the framework um, within which how the county budget is framed and how we prioritize those allocations. So thank you again for your presentation and the very helpful slideshow. I'll be linking it to uh, my website, so second district residents are familiar with the process and hopefully engage in a meaningful way. With that, the order of remarks um, that we will hear from members today will be SD5, followed by SD1, 3, and 4. Supervisor Barger. Thank you, Chair Mitchell. And I'd like to first express my thanks to all who worked diligently 
to get us to this important point in the budget process. In particular, Fizia, you and your entire team. I know um, my deputy, Michelle Vega, as well as all the budget deputies that have worked on the eighth floor. Um, you know, I think that uh, when you look at the leadership of the CEO and, and, and Fiza, you have Matt McGlone, who's doing a fantastic job. Your collective efforts drive the county's budgeting process and ensure that we are allocating our resources effectively and efficiently, which the slide presentation um, reflected. I want to thank our county departments as well. Um, you work hand in hand with our board and with our county CEO to develop and implement budgets to meet the needs of our constituents and support our county workforce, something that has to go hand in hand. There are a few points that I'd like to highlight regarding today's deliberations. I am glad to see that $12 million will be allocated to the Sheriff's Department for two additional academy classes to hire and train new sheriff's deputies. This is essential so that we can prevent overtime costs, help STEM attrition, and ultimately keep our community safe. I believe that we need to continue to do more and consider additional opportunities to support law enforcement, such as the MET team. We must do all that we can to protect residents, business owners, and support public safety. But at the same time, I think we are rightfully, uh, I think it's important that we increase our support for diversion and other community-based programs to provide successful alternatives to prevent individuals from getting involved in the justice system and to help those who have been in our justice system. I strongly support funding public safety and community divergence strategies. We should not take an either or approach when it comes to funding these priorities. Again, they go hand in hand. I also support continuing to provide adequate resources to the type of programs to help youth, to help our youth succeed. I'm pleased to see additional funding for the Parks After Dark program and recreational swimming at county parks. Both foster outdoor activities, social engagement, and physical health. We also have a variety of programs offered by our libraries that help young minds grow and thrive and keep our teens and young adults engaged. I would argue we have one of the best library systems in the state, probably in this country, based on the fact that we have engagement um, and are really focused on, on access for our youth. We also have a variety of programs offered that, that will provide um, support. Um, I know in my libraries, and I don't think it's unique to the fifth district, that provide food service um, during lunch for those that may need um, a, a, a meal at our libraries. These type of programs at our parks, libraries, and community centers are typically targeted for vulnerable neighborhoods and at-risk populations. I support the strategic approach. Both parks and libraries could benefit from an assessment of their funding. We need to have a clearer picture of what resources are needed that they can staff and implement programs that engage our constituents and contribute to their well-being and success. And as we discuss at-risk populations, we must acknowledge a significant deficit facing our Department of Children and Family Services. These are children and youth for whom this county is responsible. We must address these budget shortfalls, which should not in any way impact our ability to best serve those who, by no fault of their own, are in our child welfare system. And finally, I would like to address the dire crisis we are facing with homelessness. In this budget, as in all our recent budgets, we are allocating millions of dollars toward strategies that are intended to connect homeless individuals to housing, mental health treatment, substance abuse services, and employment opportunities. Clearly, what we are doing um, to date is, has, has, has made little movement, but we can do more. We've spent billions of dollars over the last several years just to see the numbers of homeless increase and more encampments crop up across the entire county. All this with the realization that people are dying alone, without dignity, and in pain on our streets every day. This is a public health crisis and it is a life or death situation. That is why we must address homelessness as a crisis and do more to save lives of those who are dying on our streets. I'm hopeful that as the county moves forward with the recommendations for the Blue Ribbon Commission on homelessness, we will be able to increasingly focus on strategies and services that will make a difference in our homeless stay and help our homeless stay off the street. Lastly, I'd like to note that while this year's budget continues to indicate strong financial growth and stability, 
we should prepare for uncertainty around the economy. I appreciate the continued increase in our reserves and dedication to maintain the social safety net. Today's budget is a reminder of the balance we must maintain so that we can continuously provide necessary services for our residents while ensuring keeping our communities safe and, and secure. And I'd like to say, you know, Fizia, the video, and I, I agree with uh, Chair Mitchell, I'm gonna put that on our website, explaining how the county budget works. Many people don't realize that much of our budget is passed through dollars from the state and the federal government. And discretionary funding that we have is very limited. And that funding does go toward libraries, parks, things that don't get a subvention or a, a federal or state dollars. And so I appreciate um, that video because I think it does help explain what to some can be confusing. Um, and I think it's important for us to do more of that on an educational basis because while we do have discretionary funds, those discretionary funds are toward uh, programs that truly are quality of life programs, especially for areas that are um, are under the um, uh, have less affluent um, populations. So I think it's important for us to maintain and ensure that things like libraries, parks after dark are funded um, to, to provide access for those that otherwise may not have it. So with that, I really commend you for this budget and I commend my colleagues um, working together. This is collaborative and I think this reflects what this board is great at and that is prioritizing, recognizing and providing services across the board. So thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor Hahn. <clears> Hahn <throat> or Solis? Yeah, I thought I was last. <laughs> we all agree, I think Hilda's next. You're you're right. I was going like in reverse numeric order in my mind and forgot our Catherine, unique order. We so, all agree. Exactly. Supervisor Solis. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And um, I also want to thank uh, our CEO, Fiza Davenport, as well as her staff for putting together uh, this budget. I want to also applaud our legislative team, our employee relations teams, and our county department heads, as well as their staff and as well as our budget deputies from all of our offices, because they have been working in a collaborative manner. So I wanna thank them personally. I also wanna take a moment to thank my own team, hashtag Team Solis, si se puede, for their continued hard work, including my budget deputy, Tammy Omoto Frias. You know, it's been another challenging year for us, and I appreciate all of us rising to the occasion again. Uh, as we close out fiscal year 2021 and look forward to the new fiscal year, I would urge all of us to be reminded that while the county's budget has stabilized, for many of our residents, recovery remains elusive. And this is especially true in the first district that I happen to represent. And for those who lived paycheck to paycheck before COVID, their recovery will take even longer still, especially given the current rate of inflation the likes of which we haven't seen in 40 years. We're getting to work because of, or you know, just trying to, to navigate to, to get to work and paying those outrageous gas prices, buying diapers and baby formula or putting food on the table has only become more of a challenge for these families. And just last week, I attended one of our first food distributions at Belvedere Park in East Los Angeles, where we partnered with the regional food bank and Baby to Baby to provide food, baby formula, and diapers to well over 1,200 households. And for me, this is indicative of the relentless needs of our communities that we all represent one way or another. And it's clear, at least to me, that our residents continue to struggle. And if the experts' forecasts hold true, we'll enter into a recession maybe in the near future. And I say maybe but we need to be prepared and we need to help prepare our residents to be able to endure any level of a recession by providing more services and relief, which is, in my opinion, what this budget does. Now is the time for us to strengthen the safety net that we're mandated by law to provide. The budget today is $39.7 billion with over 112,000 employees, and that's a lot of good paying union jobs. And it's my hope that with the increased number of positions, we can again look at bringing some of the jobs we contract out back in-house as we had committed to before the pandemic. And as the budget continues to be refined during the budget phases, I'm pleased that the following adjustments are being made 
that are important to many of the residents that I represent in the first district. The transfer of staffing and resources to the newly established Department of Economic Opportunity so that this department, which I also authored a motion to create, can help bring jobs and industry to LA region starting in the new fiscal year. $460,000 of our internal services department, ISD, to help them continue the countywide promotional campaign to inform residents about the avail available subsidy that will help them reduce the cost for computers and internet service. Nothing was more clear to me during this pandemic than that digital divide. And this is uh, under a motion for accelerating the digital equity that I authored, authored last year. $103,000 will go to fund one position for chapter eight agreement sale program, which I authored to identify tax defaulted properties so they can be converted to affordable housing, something that is high, high on our list. $12.7 million for the Care First Community Investment Funds or CFCI funds directed to the Department of Public Health, Mental Health and Health Services for Mental Health and Substance Abuse Treatment and Housing. And also increased staffing for the Department of Health Services, specifically $3.8 million for 22 radiology positions at High Desert and six community health centers, including in our district, El Monte and the Roy Ball Center in East LA. $3.3 million for 19 staff for patient center medical homes at LAC USC in the first district and also in all of you. And $2.6 million for 13 ophthalmology staff at LAC USC in High Desert, something that was mentioned by our CEO. And at LAC USC, the conversion of 12 clinical contracted staff into permanent county staff so that we can retain our valuable workforce and continue to provide quality health care to our most vulnerable residents. For me, those are commitments that we made and that we are honoring. For the Department of Mental Health, the budget reflects an increase of $80.6 million in Mental Health Services Act Fund, which include $51 million for crisis residential treatment programs, $29 million for community ambassador network providers. However, I would like to see more stabilized funding with DMH's resources to help expand the Prometoras program and develop a sustainable career leadership program there. This is a program that I supported along with many of my colleagues here for many years. And I started uh, on that trajectory back in the 1990s in the state legislature. This program has grown. It is hugely successful. We saw it working very well during the pandemic to connect our heart to reach communities, to inform residents in their languages and at their level. And I am just so proud of that program. $909,000 in one-time funding for the probation department for the at Parks After Dark program, which is a key youth engagement prevention and intervention tool. I would like to see an ongoing investment in this program as well as improved programming that better engages our residents at the local level. That includes also working with the Department of Public Health's Office of Violence and Prevention, which is receiving $25 million this year through efforts that we've worked on to prevent, prevent gang, gang involvement and, and provide intervention tools and hopefully uh, a way to navigate through programs to get better education and job training. I'm also pleased to see funding in the budget for new park facilities, including $984,000 for the River Park, which has newly been named. It was previously known as a duck farm in unincorporated La Puente, but I also would like to see the project fully funded and also see improvements in the Shabarm Regional Park and unincorporated Roland Heights, which was redistricted to my district this past December. It'll, it will be critical that funding is provided for projects in the unincorporated areas, such so that we continue to provide programming and maintain operations that is expected by our community. The budget also includes $250,000 of one-time NCC funds for a needs assessment for the countywide cultural policy adopted in 2020. But as we know, stems from the cultural equity and inclusion initiative that I offered back in 2015. I'm very, very happy to see that this is moving forward to ensure equitable access to the arts and culture in every part of LA County. $1.3 million in state revenue for 14 positions in the Office of the Assessor, three of which will be trainers for a pipeline program that I authored to recruit and train eligible students 
of Rio Hondo Community College, which creates job opportunities for county entry level appraisers, something that we we um, dramatically need. $205,000 to add one position in the CEO's communi countywide communication unit, which will focus on ethnic and hyperlocal media, something that I have been advocating now for a number of years. County departments have been doing a great job of posting information on their websites and social media in multiple languages. But the reality is that people don't always come to us for information. So we need to go to them where those news outlets have a better form of access as well as uh, the types of programming that some of our residents listen to, as well as making sure that we are uh, providing, you know, just the whole multiplicity of languages that many of our residents require. $712,000 in to the probation department and $6.5 million to the sheriff's department to address SB 1421, the public request act <clears throat> per a motion that I presented. And finally, $1.2 million for the first district discretionary funding to the sheriff's department to fund the crime enforcement team at the Walnut and industry stations, as well as trail enforcement in Hacienda Heights and Roland Heights. This will ensure that there's no lapse in services in the unincorporated communities that have been redistricted to the first. The challenges ahead of us are relentless, but I know that together we can overcome them. And I also wanna thank our CEO for uh, posting her new uh, video that helps to outline some of those priorities in terms of where funding goes to the appropriate uh, budget items that we prioritize and the community prioritizes, but also hopefully gaining a better understanding of what it means to be responsible as a county board of supervisor in terms of the services that we're required to provide, especially in unincorporated areas where we, in fact, are the mayors of those local areas. Many people don't quite understand that, and I hope that through this educational process, we can achieve that. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and to my colleagues for all the great work that you've done. This is a reflection of our values, our hopes, and our dreams, and our aspirations. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Kuehl. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm feeling a lot of gratitude uh, this morning, even though we've been through some really hard, oh, just say Supreme Court decisions in the past week. Uh, people um, really experienced sort of a downturn in, uh, in our rights. And I look at this budget, which is an expression of the moral values of this county um, more than anything. And I am proud of us. Uh, this is my eighth year uh, here. And when I came to the board, the vision was quite different. And FISIA has done a wonderful job of presenting how we get to where we're going, what the pressures are, et cetera. She referred to our vision at one point as ambitious policy goals. And I think that is exactly what is needed. I want to embrace the statements of my colleagues who have preceded me in talking about this budget and looking forward to Janice's statements as well, because I um, believe in all of these aspects that we have developed and put into the budget and thank Fija for working so hard with her staff to make that come to reality because the county exists, counties in California, the 58 of us exist and we're 25% of the whole state really to extend a helping hand to those who just can't make it without us. And I think we are doing a very, very good job of it with what we have. Our priorities have shifted I would say we're much more client oriented, much more oriented to second chances. And I'm proud of the work that you've done, Fija, with your staff. I'm proud of my colleagues, I'm very proud of Team QL, and especially my budget deputy, Angelica Ayala, who uh, explains every aspect of this budget to me in ways that I can understand, which is important. Um, so I want to talk for a moment to talk about some of my key priorities that are included in this budget and also a few that might be missing 
and need to be considered in the supplemental budget in October. So Madam Chair, at the end of my comments, I do have two questions to our CEO. First of all, I want to lift up the Department of Aging and Disabilities and thank Janice so much for pushing and pushing for this as we talk about what we would do to separate out some of the departments that were jammed together in WEDAX and see if we couldn't make them, lift them up more, make them special. Uh, this budget establishes the department with a total budget of uh, over 150 million, almost 500 positions. And with the creation of this standalone department, the county, the new director, Laura Trejo, will be able to grow the, the way we network to try to help those seniors in our county and in our region build strong partnerships to ensure that services to this population in LA flourish and adapt uh, because we know this population is growing. I may be overly interested in it at the moment, being such a member of it, but I uh, want to say that I'm also happy to see that LA County and LA City will better coordinate our age-friendly initiatives for this rapidly growing population to unite public and private leadership, resources, ideas, and strategies to improve the lives of older Angelinos. Second, I wanna lift up the new Department of Economic Opportunity, uh, officially established uh, with a total budget of 161.9 million, 178 positions. These positions have generally been transferred as uh, the same is true with aging and disabilities from our WEDAX department, but I think in a more strategic way. I wanna recognize Kelly LoBianco, our new director of the Department of Economic Opportunity. She absolutely hit the ground running, taking this idea that we had as a board to consolidate and strengthen our workforce development programs, our economic development programs, and you know, taking that vision and making it a reality. Kelly and her team have already began to advance uh, workforce development strategies aligned with our vision of creating pathways into sustained permanent jobs in high growth sectors for our LA residents, who especially those who have barriers to employment. And this does relate to cutting down on the jail population, because as you know, if you've got a record, it's a lot harder to get a job. And we, you know, we're, we've done everything we can to try to help with that. So you can already see progress in some of the key programs that were launched. I love our program, our place program that we talked about last Tuesday, uh, I guess two weeks ago now, where we are looking at our own beneficiaries in, you know, DPSS, people coming out of jail, uh, foster kids who are aging out and saying, how can we help them, train them and place them? And we're doing it for hundreds at a time. And I'm really, really proud of that program. Uh, it's also great to see um, ongoing support uh, financially and through technical and legal assistance in this new department to our small businesses. They're key to our local economy. And of course, as we know, we're devastated by the pandemic. And again, look to the county to help. I mean, we are kind of it. You know, I've compared us to the people who walk behind the horses at parades because we don't make the messes, but everybody says, what are you doing to clean up the mess I made? And I think actually this budget does reflect our commitment to being there for people who need us. I, I thirdly, I wanna lift up the new Department of Youth Development, I, a dream of mine, uh, of Mark Ridley Thomas's when he was here and the five of us have agreed how important that is to transition to a care first model for young people in the county. I'm really pleased to see the establishment of this department with an initial budget of 25 million, 22 positions, including the department head position. It's not as much, and the scope will be a little lean at first, but it is so important to establish that department, that vision, and look to the growth of that department so that all of our youth, youth services that are not required by law to be done through probation, which is essentially only locking up kids, um, 
is going to be transferred, hopefully, to this department. Um, one objective is to implement our care first approach to duties that have historically rested, but I think inappropriately with law enforcement. The concept of youth development is so much broader than simply diversion from the justice system. There's so much room to reimagine upstream prevention efforts, really, really important. Let's keep people from getting involved in the justice system, especially our young people. Community-based supports for young people, the establishment of actual physical locations where young people can gather and access friendships, mentoring, programs, what they need. So I look forward to seeing this department grow and feeling its impact uh, on all the places that young people gather, live, and need some help. Fourth, I'm really pleased to see the second year commitment of an additional 100 million, just as we said we would, even though Measure J was thrown out by the courts, 100 million towards Care First Community Investments, formerly known as Measure J. This brings the ongoing allocation to 200 million so far, with the goal to grow to 300 million next fiscal year. We have made a commitment to building a Care First Jail Last system. Measure J was another mechanism to accomplish this goal. Talk about vision. When I first came on this board, we were still building jails. We were building out jails. We were voting to build jails. And then we said, oh, no, no, let's do a giant mental health facility that is a jail. So, I mean, you know, we've come a long way, and this is one of our commitments. We did not even allow the preliminary ruling about Measure J from stopping this work because we committed to doing it anyway. And since the passage of Measure J, there's been tremendous engagement from diverse community members from all over LA County who put in lots of hours, tremendous passion towards developing recommendations. So this second year commitment will materialize as deeper investments for our most vulnerable communities. Fifth, affordable housing. It it's, continues to be a top priority in our efforts to stop the flow into homelessness. I mean, our housing market is, let's face it, it's simply unaffordable. I mean, I wouldn't be able to rent an apartment now, I'm just telling you. When I was just out of college and working at UCLA, I could actually afford an apartment in Westwood for what I was being paid. It, it's just unthinkable now for our kids and grandkids. And we need these affordable homes half a million of them that don't exist yet. And it demands a steadfast commitment to funding housing and services. I'm proud to say I introduced the motion over six years ago to establish and grow the Affordable Housing Trust Fund to $100 million in ongoing funding every year. And I'm really grateful, Fija, I'm really grateful that you have stuck with this commitment, found a way to honor it. And we've got it in fiscal year 22-23 on track to make it a permanent ongoing so we can do affordable housing for many years to come. I also want to highlight in sort of finally a few priorities. I hope we'll receive a little more attention and funding, just have to say. First of all, the new Justice Care and Opportunities Department, JCOD. I'm really excited that we're standing this up. It's, it's so important to a Care First Jail's last vision. It's like a new department that really talks about Care First. But to ensure the success of this transformative department, we've got to fund administrative and leadership items. We've got to fund office space, supplies and equipment to support the transition of our existing initiatives into this department. Funding is also needed to expand the existing initiatives that are the foundation of JCOD rapid diversion, pre-trial services, so important to keeping people out of jail, re-entry services, so important to helping them when they come out of jail, um, currently under-resourced. Scaling up resources for those initiatives that are going into JCOD will really help ensure success and not set ourselves up for failure so people can go, see, I told you it didn't work. No, put the money in and it works. Um, Secondly, in things that I think need a little more help, accountability and oversight entities. Extremely important to this board 
Over the last few years, we've established three oversight entities. The Office of Inspector General came first, the Civilian Oversight Commission to oh, just tell us what the sheriff's done and what needs to be done. And the newest, our Probation Oversight Commission, very healthy, very robust, and very vocal. And so I'm pleased to see an initial investment of three positions for our oversight bodies, but given how much we ask them to do, I hope we'll continue to demonstrate support for their work by fully funding necessary staff positions. They need it, and they need it to better meet their investigatory oversight and community engagement duties. Third, arts and culture. Yeah, 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 I've been talking arts and culture ever since I got here. Fortunately, everybody is on board for this, but we still need more support. With the transition of this new department of arts and culture, the growth of civic arts projects, the adoption of a countywide cultural policy, which is great, uh, we've asked a tremendous, a, a tremendous amount from the Department of Arts and Culture, but the increased workload has not come with the staff positions really needed to do it. I'm very pleased to see two civic art positions in the budget. I hope the remaining three positions that the department identified in their request are prioritized for funding ASAP. Finally, I wanna talk about domestic violence. We took a stand in the last meeting about needing and wanting to fund shelters. They are on the front line for our response to domestic violence. And we have not really adequately set aside ongoing funding to stabilize the shelter-based care agencies. That's what we voted on a couple of weeks ago. This is 24-hour shelter, food, clothing, basic needs, also taking care of their children, case management for our survivors even after they leave the shelter. They're doing virtually all the work. So as I said, we recently approved a motion that uh, Janice and I brought, allocate 3.1 million in funding to the Department of Public Health in order to stabilize, sustain, and expand that shelter system. And it is critical. So it's my hope that these funds will be identified in the supplemental budget. Fisha's tired of hearing me talk about it, but I'm talking about it anyway. And these services can be consistently maintained not just like here's a little bit and now we're walking away. We also have to increase the availability of program and support services that serve survivors. In addition to looking to ARP and state legislation, we have to consider all other potential funding opportunities. I thank you, Madam Chair, and now I have two questions for the CEO. First of all, um, Fizia, uh, I know that programs have been transferred from your office to the executive office um, in the recommended budget, and they're not really adequately resourced yet. Um, I really appreciate the CEO saying, I need to be a kind of, you know, you know, nurturing and growth factory for new programs, and then they need to go somewhere so that I can do whatever you're going to invent in the next year. And I really understand that. But the transfer of several commissions into the EO's office, let us say, for instance, the Los Angeles Native American Commission, the Human Relations Commission, both came over from WEDAX, as well as the transfer of the entire Chief Sustainability Office uh, and the Office of Protocol from your office. Um, it, they are not really resourced. And I know you know but the Native American Commission benefited in WEDAX from help with their contracting, which is not taken into account yet in the EO's office. And they have federal contracts, as you know, that they must maintain. So I wanna just lift up the commissions that were transferred in and no, no criticism to Celia, but honestly, in the, in the final, um, final, final, final look at the budget in September, uh, in supplemental, uh, we really have to look at this. Secondly, the Youth Commission. The Youth Commission is lacking in resources, and it's unique because we have staffed and peopled the Youth Commission with young members with lived experience. They're often in need themselves 
of additional support and services to make it work, to know how to make recommendations and still survive. So positions are really needed to assist with triaging, with problem solving, with helping with development of life and leadership skills, support for their meetings, support for the day-to-day -day work of the commission. This is really important. And I can't tell you how much I will continue to push and, and be obnoxious about um, making certain that these commissions get funded, especially the Youth Commission. So my question to you is, is there a plan to ensure that these commissions and programs are right-sized? Thank you, Supervisor Kuehl, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to um, have this conversation. Uh, so I've been in discussion, my office has been in discussion with the executive office um, about the transfer of the commissions as well as the sustainability office. And I'd like to uh, just take a minute to calibrate the premise um, here. Um, when we work to transfer, for example, the sustainability office, we transferred the entire budget, salary and employee benefits and services and supplies. The same is true for Linnaic as well as the Human Rights Commission. But you make a very good point, which is the support that those organizational units had in their prior offices. So for example, when the sustainability office was established in a CEO, we imagined that there might be some needs to do contracting and we essentially absorbed that workload. So when we established the office, we didn't also add positions or new positions in CEO to do the contracting. And I think uh, the glitch in the ointment here is as we work with the executive office, we assumed that the executive office would be able to assume the workload. And I think there are two things here. One is workload, and then one is the knowledge, skill, and ability of the staff to get the work done. Um, and so I've had conversations with the executive officer about looking towards supplemental budget. Um, it's not just a question of additional staff, it's a question of staff with a higher skill set that's uh, able to handle the contracting uh, part of the work. So with that said, we are in conversation with the executive office. Uh, we are looking to supplemental um, to not just add staff, but figure out the right level um, so that the executive office can provide the support uh, for these organizational units that they had when they were um, pre, you know, before their transfer. And then on the youth, um, commission, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. And then the Please. second piece on the youth commission, we do have a report back in supplemental. Uh, we will also continue to work with the uh, with the executive office to um, uh, identify uh, a budget recommendation to um, you know try as much as we possibly can to make sure that this need is met. Um, I thank you very much. I mean, I I know you know there's a lot of muscle in the CEO's office, probably more muscle than in any one of our individual offices and a lot of uh, access to, well, you can borrow this guy and you can borrow this woman and you know they'll help. And that's what kind of worries me because we put a lot of faith in these commissions, uh, especially the new youth commission. And you know we just lost the executive director of that commission. And part of it was just overwhelming, not any fault to him, just, you know, you can't do it without more help. So I thank you for that. Uh, my last question um, is, hmm, may not be terribly responsible, but I think I've made it clear in the past, I'm not a big fan of socking money away and letting it sit there. When we look at our unmet needs and we look at our populations, uh, I'm not profligate, but not a big saver. So I was just interested because in each one of our budgets, we put aside money for appropriation for contingencies. That is meant to be something that we use instantly when we have contingencies that need to be met. However, virtually every year that fund is untouched and is transferred automatically into the rainy day fund, which I do understand people want to grow more than I do, but okay, I accept that. 
So in the fiscal year 22-23 recommended budget, we approved the allocation of $20 million of ongoing NCC to the appropriation for contingency account. In this final changes budget, there's a proposal to allocate an addition almost 5 million of NCC. So let's say that's about 50 million in appropriation for contingencies, which look like it's just gonna sit there and then be transferred you know, into the rainy day fund. Now, if this is just a device to help the rainy day fund grow, I, I kind of want to understand that, but it seems like we're essentially building up the rainy day fund with this in each budget, but calling it something else. Um, so I, the question is, what are the uses of the appropriation for contingency funds? Have they ever been used in the past five years? And is this just a way to say, we're putting this aside early and it will automatically go into the rainy day fund because you know if it's set aside for emergent need and we've got a list of you know billions of dollars of unmet needs um i know it's a small amount but i still want to kind of understand so what do we use the appropriation for contingency funds for and have they been used in the last five years thank you supervisor um so the appropriation for contingencies we actually describe as our baby rainy day fund and so i look at them as a a and a b in our rainy day fund we set a percentage and then we set a target that we want to reach and then we give ourselves a number of years to reach that target however we know that our locally generated revenues our ongoing revenues they grow over time so if we just set aside a fixed amount of funding each year into our rainy day fund, we're not actually keeping up with the growth in our revenues. And that's where the appropriation for contingencies come in. The appropriation for contingencies basically allows us to keep up with the growth in our locally generated revenues. Um, I'm sorry, it allows us to keep up with setting aside a certain amount of our locally generated revenues. So we have two parts, the rainy day fund, we typically set aside an amount every year and we are hope to reach a target over a certain amount of time. But we know that our gener our revenues are not fixed, that they grow every, you know, they tend to grow, we hope, over time. And so what we do is we use our uh, appropriation for contingencies to supplement the amount that we're already setting aside in the rainy day fund. With that said, um, we I think you asked if we have what are its uses. Basically, we use it as a hedge against any unforeseen financial issues during a given fiscal year. Uh, for example, if the county's locally generated revenue receipts were significantly lower than anticipated, then we would tap into these funds to support county operations and avoid making cuts to the budget in the middle of the fiscal year. And as you correctly point out, while these funds have not been used in the last five years for such of an emergency, we were prepared to tap into um, the appropriation for contingencies in fiscal year 1920. I know that seems a very long time ago uh, at the beginning of the pandemic as economic uncertainty grew during the onset of the pandemic. Fortunately, the property and sales tax revenue taxes revenues did not dip as low as projected and state general funds were provided to cover some of our shortfalls in our 1991 realignment revenue and our vehicle lease license fee realignment revenues. So we didn't need to use the funds. Secondly, um, I think it's important to note that this is a, not a, a, you know, sort of a random budgetary exercise of the CEO's office. We are establishing and, and transferring funds to our appropriation for contingencies pursuant to board policy. Um, um, the policy recently was changed. We set aside many years ago, uh, the target was 10% of our ongoing locally generated revenues. We met that amount. We know that best practice is 17%. Uh, we had a lot of discussion about that on our recent um, tax revenue anticipation notes um, meeting when we went to New York with the rating agencies. Uh, and so we have not used it. 
it is there for contingencies and we need it to be available in the event uh, that the need arises. And if we don't use it, uh, you are correct, it does transfer to the larger rainy day fund. Well, I, um, I, I, as I said, I could be a person, my mother would not be proud of me because she was a great saver. But uh, if, if I, I don't think, if this isn't a rainy day, I don't know what is. I mean, yes, our revenue is up and yes, in order to keep our bond rating up, we need to do this. And my colleagues voted, though I was not in favor to increase the percentage of the rainy day fund. And of course, the contingency, I guess, is how we get there in the current budget, but we've been adding to it as well. Um, I will continue to advocate to use the money to help save and improve people's lives. And, uh, you know, unapologetically. Uh, and Fija, we are your worst nightmare in that sense, because we're saying, do the right thing, but spend this money, spend more money. And we've got another idea for you to spend money. But I think spending money is what we do in the county because that's how we help people. It's all human capital services. We're saving lives. And um, so I'll continue to push for spending more unapologetically, but thank you so much for the work you've done. And thanks to my colleagues um, for all, you know, the vision that we put together together. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank, thank you, you, Supervisor. Ms. Yeah. Davenport, thank, thank you, um, Supervisor. Ms. Davenport, I know that you wanted to um, make a correction to your earlier presentation before we hear from uh, Supervisor Hahn. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so previously on slide three of my presentation, I talked about uh, the $1.2 billion growth in funding between the recommended budget and the final changes budget. Um, and I uh, indicated that the $447.8 million uh, for DMH was primarily uh, ministerial, that it was a change from one reserve account to another. That actually is not correct. The $447.8 million represents an increase in the MHSA budget. Uh, that is the information that we have received from the state, and it primarily results from improved revenue estimates to fund a range of mental health services now and in the future. Um, I know that um, the DMH has a mental health services uh, commission process that they use to allocate the funds, but I did want to go on record uh, correcting that, that it is um, uh, additional revenue. Thank you very much, Supervisor Hahn. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, um, and thank you, uh, Fizia, for uh, your your presentation. Uh, and I too want to acknowledge uh, how much time and effort and dedication uh, your team and all of our budget deputies have spent uh, to get us uh, this far. A big shout out to mine, uh, Mark, uh, and also with the help of Carlos, who kind of came in at the end uh, to, to work on uh, what we're doing today. Um, and may I say, each one of my colleagues, you have been so um, articulate and um, and um, really good at uh, giving your perspective um, on things that were important to you, but but also reminding everybody um, why this budget is a moral document, uh, and it, it it does speak to the ten million. Uh, residents, which uh, we all uh, work every day to represent and, and to govern in um, in ways that um, you know with integrity uh, and and passion. So I think each one of you has really spoken so well uh, before I got here. Uh, Fizi, I think you should take a clip from each of their remarks and intersperse it uh, with that video. Uh, it really uh, brings the, the human element um, and the supervisor's perspective on what we're doing and this budget. And I really also want to thank um, all the members of the public who raised their voices through um, comments that we heard on May 11th 
um, and the hundreds that that wrote in with specific requests about our our budget document. I really want to uh, thank Supervisor Barger. I, I really appreciate your remarks uh, as it related to our homeless initiative and how uh, that continues to be a priority for each of us. Um, and um, hearing you describe it in sort of life and death um, consequences and measure uh, really does remind us that that, that is, is so important that we continue to make that a priority. We continue to fund uh, those different initiatives that um, will make a difference, will lift uh, lives off of our streets um, and into um, either shelters or interim housing. And um, as I think Sheila talked about, affordable housing eventually. Uh, we've got to keep marching toward that um, Los Angeles County that I think we all believe in. Um, and so I wanted to highlight a couple of things in this budget that um, I also noticed and appreciate. Uh, the budget continues funding for LA Found, uh, which is our innovative program that helps our families deal with the constant worry of their loved ones going missing, uh, either because they have dementia or Alzheimer's. Also, we know that 50% of all um, young people who have autism will wander at some point. Uh, and just to remind everybody, it was launched after the disappearance and, and unfortunate death of uh, a, a woman. Her name was Nancy Palikas, and she was a Manhattan Beach resident who um, went missing uh, after her and her family were visiting uh, LACMA. It's the last time they saw her. Uh, she came to an untimely end, um, but it uh, her husband, Kirk, worked with us to say, you know what, families that go through this should have the county safety net uh, being there at all times to help them uh, find their missing loved ones. And I'm happy to say um, this was a pilot program that we all uh, launched, not really understanding how it would work, but it has been so successful. We've uh, already um, reunited uh, around 30 people who um, left, wandered, went missing, and we return them to their families, sometimes in minutes, sometimes uh, in a couple hours, but so different than the way it used to be with maybe months or even years uh, before people could find their loved ones. We've distributed over a thousand of those uh, bracelets um, that are connected uh, to our 911 system and connected to the sheriff's department who then uh, really are called into action when one of them uh, is activated. And uh, I know, thank you, uh, Sheila, you gave a great uh, uh, overview of our aging and disabilities department. And thank you for that. I think I agree with you. It's such, a, it's the right time for us to create an apartment that is solely focused uh, on our um, aging residents and particularly those who have disabilities here in the LA County. And um, they have made staffing requests, uh, which will be important. Uh, to get this department um, up and running uh, successfully. Uh, we've spent three years exploring and planning how to get to this point. And it makes me so happy that July 1st, uh, this department will be realized under the vision of Dr. Trejo. I congratulate my colleagues uh, on that uh, great hire, uh, which I think will be key to that department being success. Um, uh, thanks also, Sheila, for your uh, talking about the Youth Commission. Uh, that's so important to me. And, and you, you said that the leadership has transitioned. Um, but I think it's so important that, that young people who have lived expertise um, are the ones that we appoint to this commission and uh, that we do hear them. And I'm glad to hear, uh, Fizia, that um, you have reiterated the fact that uh, you will be working with the executive office um, so that we can make sure that we support this uh, mission-driven uh, critical work of, of that commission. Um, I'm really happy that we're, uh, we're um, 14 alternate public defender positions that were curtailed during the pandemic have been restored, uh, along with adding 17 deputy public defender positions uh, to help. They not only have a, a backlog that they're trying to 
get a handle on, but I, I look at their work as it relates to our to our homeless initiative. And um, you know, our homeless courts uh, that some of our cities are beginning to set up really depend on, on our public defenders uh, for helping uh, with all sorts of issues that our homeless neighbors are experiencing, again, to get them back on track uh, and uh, giving them a pathway to a better life. Uh, I'm also pleased to see that there is uh, funding for two additional academy classes to recruit new deputies uh, to fill some of the vacancies that we've had in our sheriff's department. I think that's important. I know it is to residents in my district. Uh, they're very uh, keen on seeing more uh, of their deputies out and about. They have good relationships with their rank and file deputies, and I know they will support this. Um, you know, during uh, the recommended budget, I um, asked uh, Euphesia to find more funding to keep our public pools open through September. And I know that uh, parks originally requested 10 million and they only got 5 million uh, in one time funding. But, um, you know, I think uh, Catherine also talked about, um, you know, how important parks are and how important recreation is. And um, uh, it, it means a lot to our residents. And it just doesn't make sense that when these heat waves with climate change are gripping us well through September and October, sometimes even November, that we don't figure out how to keep our uh, county pools open uh, for swimming in those months. So uh, I'm looking to uh, see if you can uh, find, you know, ongoing funding for that. I, I just think it's critical uh, for our residents. Uh, they also, um, I did like the slide about prioritizing priorities. And I think that really, uh, it is it is uh, is the path that you're going to have to walk going forward, and um, I, I think it's critical that you know the public understands um, that there are different priorities. Some are uh, mandated uh, through uh, the courts uh, that we spend certain monies in certain ways, and others are um, priorities that we uh, on the board of supervisors have articulated uh, that are important. Um, I think, again, about uh, pools, um, I think uh, the parks has requested $10 million for pool capital improvements. And uh, this is important, again, that they upgrade our pools, they make them safe, they added lights uh, for evenings as people continue to swim. And one of the projects in my district that's important to me is uh, the Greater Whittier Community Aquatic Center. And as supervisors, I, I put in about $20 million to fund this project. And this is a community that does not have access to uh, one of our, our pools. This resident, the residents in this area are, are waiting uh, for a long time for this facility to open. And, you know, I, I allocated some money to get this project up and running. It is expected to open in October, but uh, it's it's frustrating for me to see that um, it is not in this budget that parks re we, uh, requested for um, staffing uh, and to make sure we get that up and running. So um, in your prioritizing priorities, this is a priority for me and I hope uh, we can figure this out. It is shovel ready, it is water ready, it is everything ready to open in October and it'll be such a shame if we couldn't figure out how to fund the lifeguards and the staffing to make that a reality. Um, and again, thank you for finding six million for our parks after dark, uh, which again I think is is a proven program uh, for our residents, particularly our young people, to again keep them from doing something else after dark. We know these programs are are valuable. Uh, there's a lot more uh, to be done. Um, Hilda, you mentioned uh, some of the redistricting that was going on uh, um, for Shabaram Park is now in your district and Hacienda Heights and Roland Heights have, have needs and you mentioned that. And in redistricting, I uh, uh, got the 10 cities in, in Sela and I'm gonna continue to look for ways to uh, spark collaboration in that region. Um, and I've met many times with the leaders in those cities. And even though there are 10 cities 
uh, in a concentrated area, they really want to unite around uh, common interests um, like safety and transportation. And uh, Sheila, I think you talked about arts and culture, right? Yay, arts and culture. Um, these communities have a vision, uh, along with Frank Gehry, uh, to build a, um, a Southeast LA cultural center. And so when we talk about our departments and we talk about money, money and staffing, we've got to make sure that gets out to our communities. Culture and arts has to leave downtown and get out to our, our, our cities. And this cultural center could be uh, that incredible vision for underserved communities um, that would like to see that. It needs lots of funding. Uh, so just wanted to put that on your radar, uh, Fuja, as something that would mean a lot to that region of our county. So thanks again to uh, everyone for, for working on this. I look forward uh, to continue to work with this incredible uh, board of supervisors. Sheila, it's hard to believe that uh, this is gonna be your last budget. Uh, because I think the five of us and our perspectives and our life um, experiences to this point have created uh, this incredible uh, vision, as you said, Sheila, very different from when uh, you, you and Hilda first got on, on this board. And so um, we're, we're going to miss you. Uh, but thanks for the, the ground uh, work that you've done of launching departments um, and, and launching a vision that will not be turned around um, anytime soon by any different uh, makeup of this Board of Supervisors. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, um, everyone. Powerful remarks, um, critical to and, and reflective of, of the magnitude of this decision that we um, are, have the privilege of making on behalf of the entire county. So we will now transition to take public comments for all budget items. Executive officer, please read the call in information that was also provided on the agenda and explain the speaking rules to those members of the public who are calling in to address the board. Thank you, Madam Chair. As indicated on the agenda, members of the public wishing to offer public comment shall call 877-336-4437 and use participant code number 1366786. To repeat, please call 877-336-4437 and use participant code number 1366786. Do not call that number if you only want to listen to the meeting. To listen only, please call 877-873-8017 one seven and follow the instructions to members of the public calling in when it's your turn to speak please state your name and begin speaking we will allocate at least 40 minutes for public comment on all of the items posted on today's agenda you will have two minutes to speak on all agenda items if additional speakers are in the queue at the end of the 40 minutes then the chair may extend the public comment period to provide them an, with an opportunity to make the public comment we will continue to accept all written comments that come in during the meeting, which will become part of the record. When speaking on an agenda item, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you're not speaking on topic, or if we cannot tell if you're speaking on an agenda item, you will get one warning from County Council or the Chair. If you do not immediately or clearly get on topic, or if you stray off topic again, you will lose, you will forfeit and, and the rest of your time and the chair will move to the next speaker. Please note that if you're also listening to the board meeting on a computer or speaker phone, you will need to turn down the volume on those devices as soon as the moderator calls on you. If you do not turn down the volume, there will be an echo. Moderator, may we have the first speaker, please. As a reminder to address the board, if you have not already done so, please press one and then zero at this time. Do not press one and zero a second time or you will be removed from the queue. We will now hear the Spanish interpretation of the reminder. Como recordatorio, para dirigirse a las supervisoras, si aún no lo ha hecho, presione uno y luego el cero en este momento. 
no presione uno y cero por segunda vez porque será eliminado de la fila. Thank you. First speaker, please. Our first participant is Paul Falk. You may begin. Hey, thank you for calling me up first. Um, I'm actually struck by one simple reality that folks from the community have been on the call since like 8.30 waiting to speak and it's been um, <laughs> two and a half hours. So I don't know how 40 minutes captures everybody's valuable comment uh, to speak on the county's budget and how it's been spent. Um, so really frustrated at that. Um, but at the end of the day, um, looking back at young people and I think back to my own reality of being caught up in the same situation um, that many young folks are being caught in today, that if I was in the same position I was in in the 90s as a 17-year-old, I would have still been on my way to prison, would have still went through the halls, would have still ended up in the county jail, would have still ended up in prison, and then the deportation machinery at the end of the day. I uh, would have still had to struggle with all of that. And so all this talk about right-sizing, when are we going to talk about right solutions? Uh, when are we going to hire people that don't have degrees, that don't have credentials, that come from the ground? Um, people that are people that are about the business, people that know the struggles, that know the hurts and the pain, people that have been shot, um, people that are, are stuck living in the communities where there are no resources, but uh, handcuffs working around the corner, same situation in the 90s and kind of back in the 90s. Um, so just want to speak up on that. Um, man, y'all got to stop ignoring the real solutions that community has been giving you to present over and over and over and continue to get gaslighted. These are real things and real struggles that we face as community and just really disappointing in all y'all. Really disappointing this board. As somebody that really loved LA County, I can't say I love LA County anymore. You know, I wanna ask this board, when will it stop loading policing and carceral budgets? When will it really listen to people? When will it give us more than 40 minutes to speak? When will it give us all this time? Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm gonna wrap up so other folks can speak, but, um. On a final note, I'm just curious when, when the phone calls from the county jails will be free so people that are locked up can talk to their children, to their family members. When our folks can stop paying a dollar um, in the county jails for a 10 cent pack of ramen. Uh, when are we going to stop putting profits um, behind and start thinking about people? Excuse me? Um, I mean, when? Your time has expired. When are we really going to do that? Can we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Matthew Miller. Please, you may begin. Hi, my name is Matt Miller. I'm one of the doctors that works for the coroner's office. Um, I just, this is a general budget item. Our, uh, in the past two years, our caseload has gone up from about 9,500 cases to about 14,500 cases. And uh, with this increase, we've obviously had a significant increase in our paperwork and other work associated with the cases. And our request is to increase the amount of overtime um, money budgeted for our department. I think we have we had less than $4,000 uh, for overtime for us to complete cases and other casework. And um, our request is the consideration of something in the range of about $40,000 of extra overtime budget. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have a next speaker, please? Our next participant is Ezekiel Mishiyama. You may begin. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, please begin. Hello, my name is Ezekiel Nishiyama. I live in District 4. I'm calling to urge the supervisors to fully fund the Department of Youth Development with $150 million in the Care First budget. To do, to do this, we need to reduce the $4.5 billion going to the Sheriff and Probation Department. This includes cutting all 400 vacant positions in juvenile probation and redirecting that money to the Department of Youth Development. Those positions have sat vacant for years and you are just wasting money. As the county is working towards youth justice reimagined, it, it is important that we uplift that Department of Youth Development and ensure that the department has all of its resources behind it. As we work towards the Care First Jail's last value county, we have to start by shifting our department structures. This means filling in the needs for our young people who are unfortunately stuck in these systems. Through the pandemic, many young people have brought up their needs as of mental health support, education, credible messengers, the needs for mentors who play a critical role in a young person's life and development. These are the areas that the county should be fully invested, fully invested in and not the probation system and not the sheriff's. 
budget. As our young people continue to grow up in Los Angeles, it is important that we as a county put them first and fully fund the Department of Youth Development, invest in our young people that will grow up to be, our, the, to be the leaders we need in the world today and help lead our county into a better future. Thank you for the time today. Thank you, next speaker, please. Our next participant is Zoe Rawson. You may begin. Good morning, Zoe Rawson with Arts for Healing and Justice Network and LA Youth Uprising. I respectfully disagree with board members. This is a budget that continues to prioritize law enforcement and continues to invest in a long arc of harm to black and brown youth, their families and their communities through our probation system and other systems whose primary role, whose function in society is to isolate people, to punish people, to incarcerate people, to isolate them from the ones that they love. We cannot repair these harms without addressing the bloated budget of probation and the sheriff and fully funding the Department of Youth Development. The lives of living, breathing, fully human children are at stake. Children have been physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually harmed by a county that overwhelmingly funds police suppression and probation. This is a long arc of repair that we're in and we are not nearly close enough. Children have been beaten in these institutions. There have been worms in their food. We have incarcerated 10 year olds. We have isolated children in solitary confinement for periods legally defined as abuse. We are still in the process of repairing this, but we are not going far enough. These lives are more important than politics. They are more important than property values. And the only way to protect them is to fully fund the Department of Youth Development and to reduce the budget and the reach of probation and police. Thank you, may we have the next speaker please? Our next participant is Elida Ledesma. You may begin. Good morning, my name is Elida Ledesma and I am the Executive Director of the Arts for Healing and Justice Network. I wanna echo my colleague Zoe's words. Um, I am calling in opposition of budget item number two and general public comment. Um, the new Department of Youth Development is scheduled to launch on July 1st and in order to ensure its success, we need to fully fund DYD with at least $150 million. The Board of Supervisors promised $75 million for Youth Justice Reimagined, uh, which $55 million was supposed to go to community-based organizations. Disappointingly, probation's budget has not changed despite them having hundreds of vacant positions for the last three years and their halls being deemed unsuitable for youth. We know that the number of young people who are experiencing incarceration and on supervision has decreased significantly. We cannot continue to spend over 1 million to incarcerate one young person. Instead, we need to take this opportunity to invest in youth development and in community, demonstrating that our, that our youth deserve better and that we believe in their potential. I urge the board to please reconsider the budget and allocate funding for the future vision that we want for this county instead of continuing to fund systems that don't work. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Bernadette Golami. You may begin. Bernadette Golami, your line is open. We're not unable to hear you. We have the next speaker, please. Our next participant is Lonnie Gordon. You may begin. Oh. Surprise. Hold on a second here. I'm speaking on uh, 4C and at 4C2 and number four. And um, I'm concerned. My, my name is Lonnie Gordon, and I'm the executive director of Malibu for Safe Tech.org. And um, I'd like you to know that I am absolutely sure that your planning department, on whom you rely, just as we do in Malibu, 
does not have the complete story to give you credible information regarding telecommunications and the budget that you're about to uh, decide upon. Ours didn't either. This is a very complicated issue and it's heavily influenced by telecom and telecom supported consultants and attorneys. Telecom doesn't care about the harm these installations and emissions may cause. Money's their bottom line. But the health and safety of your constituents is in your hands and you have the power to make the right decisions based on scientific facts. The bottom line is I'm asking you to hold or pause making a decision on the telecom budget until you have more facts. I've read all your statements about the budget issues and please contact us if you want more information on this particular issue. We have multiple experts who will be happy to speak with you privately if you prefer. Residents are concerned about Title 16 and 22 and the significant emphasis that's being put on telecommunications. Perhaps people in general don't understand that bead money, which is broadband equity access and deployment money, is available for underserved communities. Fiber can now be strung along utility poles as opposed to buried. Also, micro trenching can be used. It's sometimes a faster process than putting up cell towers and certainly more aesthetically pleasing. Fiber is the future and it's safer and not a fire risk. Fiber is what we see cities and counties going to. The Biden administration has shown a preference for fiber to the premises. This is not to the exclusion of wireless, but there are multiple reasons for this decision. Our attorney, Excuse Scott me? McCullough, certainly. Your uh, time has expired. Done. May we have the next speaker, please? Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Our next participant is Kath Rogers. You may begin. Hi there. My name is Kath Rogers. I'm with the ACLU of Southern California, and I live in South LA. And first, um, we want to echo our partner's request for the board to fully fund Measure J, the Family Assistance Program, CFCI, community-based mental health department and the care first budget. Um, second, we ask the board to eliminate phone fees and commissary markups in county jails. This was already recommended by the CEO and will help stop exploitation of vulnerable and system impacted families. Uh, third, we urge the board to reallocate AB 1869 funds and dedicate those funds to alternatives to incarceration, not probation courts or law enforcement. Uh, fourth, we urge the board to allocate funding to unhoused community members living in desert encampments in the Antelope Valley. Um, folks in these encampments lack access to basic survival supplies, including drinking water in the hot desert heat. Um, so this funding allocation could literally save lives, especially in and around Lancaster. Um, finally, we ask the board to eliminate all LASD host funding. Law enforcement is dangerous um, with houseless encampments and inconsistent with basic outreach principles and police should never be first responders to houselessness. Thank you for all of the work that's gone into the budget and for your consideration of these important requests. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Kim Yargin. You may begin. Oh, uh, good morning. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kim Yargin, and I am a resident of uh, Supervisorial, it's hard to say that word, District uh, 2. I'm speaking uh, general comments and on item number 3B, I support the Healthy LA recommendations for the Los Angeles County 2022-23 fiscal year budget. Regarding item 3B, I am concerned about the lack of investment in community land trust in this year's uh, proposed budget. The community must expand, expand last year's successful, greatly successful community land trust acquisition and rehab pilot program to be funded at $30 million to remove the additional, to remove an additional number of properties from the speculative market and then in t into um, tenant ownership. We appreciate the dedication of additional funding for the Chapter 8 program and the recognition of the value of ensuring that tax defaulted properties are prioritized for the affordable housing. We, rec we recommend that this program be named as a community land trust partnership program as was done last year. 
in order to ensure these properties will, will serve the community in perpetuity and the opportunities for the resident ownership for a resident ownership can be advanced. I urge you to adopt these recommendations. Um, thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Gloria Gonzalez. You may begin. Gloria Gonzalez, your line is open. We're unable to hear you. Hi, good morning. Can you all hear me? Yes, please begin. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Okay. Please begin. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, Gloria Gonzalez with the Youth Justice Coalition and the Los Angeles Youth Uprising Coalition. I'm here to demand that you, the Board of Supervisors, keep your promises and commitments that you have made to the people um, in LA County and the young people. In August of 2019, the Board of Supervisors unanimously passed a motion to establish the Youth Justice to Imagine Work Group. You all, the Board of Supervisors, vote, voted, made a commitment to again all of the youth in Los Angeles County and their families to embark in a tangible journey that would reimagine the youth justice system that for decades has failed youth and families in LA County. Last year, you all, the Board of Supervisors, spent over $1 million per youth to incarcerate you all spent $1 million per year per youth to keep them incarcerated and we are set and you all are set to do it again. In order to not replicate spending funding to keep a young person in lockup, one way to start is by cutting all 400 vacant <clears throat> positions from juvenile probation and redirect that money to the Department of Youth Development. $150 million needs to be reinvested in the Department of Youth Development. The board promised $75 million for Youth Justice Reimagined to launch, and you all are still giving us only YDD's budget. Keep your promise and commitments to the young people and their families in LA. $25 million is not enough to build a strong DYD infrastructure and provide community-based organizations with funding to establish resources in Los Angeles County. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Anthony Robles. You may begin. Good morning, this is Anthony. Um, I'm, uh, I'm commenting on item two and, and, public, and general comment. Um, I'm an active member of the Layup Coalition, a very active um, participant in the um, and, and facilitator of the Youth Justice Advisory Work Group. And um, I I feel like this this. this this public comment is basically a waste of time. Um, and the fact that we have to keep saying the same talking points over and over and over, you all already understand this. Um, and we all know what the issues that are going on with, within juvenile probation and just within the county as a whole for young people. Um, it's sad that this this county, the city, and this county were, were established in 1850 immediately after the U.S. annexation of uh, the Southwest that used to be part of Mexico. Um, and since 1850, there has been no concerted effort or funding or investment in young people. And to this year is probably the first time we're getting a Department of Youth Development. The only current investment we get in young people is that's as significant is in juvenile probation and DCFS. Anything else? Um, I either can't think of it or I've never heard of it or it doesn't exist. Um, and those are the only investments LA County has made in young people since I've been alive. And, uh, and it's, 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 a, it's a waste of time to even be here saying like we need to invest. We need at least $150 million into the Department of Youth Development this fiscal year um, to get it started off the right foot so we can actually develop a county with successful young people that aren't trapped in poverty or um being criminalized or things like that um and you know and it's sad you know we're, we're we're on stolen land this country was developed on stolen land stole everything um and has maintained its power um through force we have an illegitimate government from the feds on down we've seen what the supreme court just took a bunch of rights to excuse me uh, reproductive excuse me your time has expired 
May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Jose Osuna. You may begin. Can you hear me? Yes, please begin. Thank you. My name is Jose Osuna. I serve as Housing Justice Manager for Brilliant Corners. I'm also a member of the Steering Committee for the Los Angeles Regional Reentry Partnership, and I'm co chair for the Long Beach Reentry Advisory Council. I'm a resident of the 4th District. Uh, just a couple of comments. Um, I commend the board for the $100 million that are being allocated to the CFCI piece, uh, but I would like to point out that that's just a drop in the bucket um, as far as what the community needs if we are truly to become a care first county as we have been saying for several years now. Um, I'd also like to say that in order to stop the cycle of incarceration, many people need housing in order to stabilize after release and for the long term. Housing is public safety. The county keeps looking for shortcuts and imaginary quick fixes to the housing crisis, but we need broader housing access, including the successful permanent supportive housing model for diversion that is pushed by the Office of Diversion and Reentry. Affordable and accessible housing has to be developed by the developers that the county is working with, and affordable means affordable for people um, that are living in those communities at that time, as opposed to pushing people out of their communities so that other folks can move in. Uh, once again, thank you for the time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Olivia Shields. You may begin. Hello, my name is Olivia Shields with Urban Peace Institute and LA's Uprising, commenting on uh, item budget two and general public comment. I want to express my excitement and extend my gratitude to Supervisors Kuehl and Mitchell for the Department of Youth Development, which will be launched on July 1st. DYD has the potential to be absolutely revolutionary for the youth of LA County, only if DYD and Youth Justice Reimagine are fully and robustly funded. And so far, the CEO has only given us a YDD's existing budget, which is not enough to create a strong DYD and efficiently provide community-based organizations with resources. We need DYD and YGR to be funded with at least $150 million this year, which includes $28.5 million to launch and staff DYD with strong administrative support and a director hired through a community-centric hiring process that elevates the voices of system-impacted youth, $55 million for youth development networks throughout the county with an emphasis on funding existing CBOs focused on youth services, $16 million for yes team credible messengers and facilities and community-based reentry services, and $50 million of ARP dollars for youth centers and youth housing, particularly use that, utilize the existing spaces to maximize resources for youth who have suffered greatly throughout the pandemic. This ask of $150 million is carefully thought through and not at all outrageous. Juvenile's probation budget is $570 million, with $410 million recommended by the CEO, again, to incarcerate about 400 young people. The notion of spending over a million dollars per year to incarcerate one young, young person, that is outrageous. Funding a probation department that is miserably fit our youth time and time again is outrageous. Central Juvenile Hall being found unsuitable for the confinement of youth for the second time in less than a year is outrageous. Cut all 400 vacant positions that have been open for the last three years in probation's budget and reallocate around the $60 million to DYD. Fund the Care First budget, including $150 million for DYD and YJR this year, and $100 million annually to fund fully fund Care First community investment, $237 million for new mental health beds to close Men's Central Jail, and $110 million per year for independent pretrial services. This funding is long overdue, and the time to act is now. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Eric Henderson. You may begin. Hi, good morning. My name is Eric Henderson, and I'm with the ACLU of Southern California. Uh, first, I want to echo and uplift our partner's request for the board to fully fund the Department of Youth Development, Family Assistance Program, CFCI, Community-Based Mental Health Department, and the Care First Budget. Second, I ask that the board um, Eliminate the phones and phone fees and commissary markups in county jails. This was recommended by the CEO and it will help end the explo exploitation of vulnerable system impacted families. Third, we urge the board to reallocate AB 1869 funds and dedicate those funds to meaningful alternatives to incarceration, not probation, not the courts, or more law enforcement. Fourth, we urge the board to allocate funding to unhoused community members living in desert encampments in the Antelope Valley. 
People in these encampments lack access to basic survival supplies, including drinking water in the hot desert. This funding allocation could literally save lives. Finally, we ask that the board eliminate all LASD host funding. Deploying law enforcement is dangerous and inconsistent with these basic outreach principles. Police should never be first responders to houselessness. Thank you for your time. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Yushra Hossein. You may begin. Hi, my name is Yushra Hossein and I'm a legal intern at the Collective for Liberatory Lawyering, working with the LA Youth Uprising Coalition to empower youth and dismantle a school to prison pipeline. I urge you today to respond to youth needs by fully funding the Department of Youth Development at $150 million and fully funding the CARE First budget. For years, the county has chosen to invest in youth incarceration while leaving a huge gap in care and resources for low income communities of color, making young people vulnerable to violence and perpetuating a cycle of incarceration. Fully funding DYD and Care First is a vital step to invest in youth potential as it will allow for the successful launch and implementation of a restorative model, which has proven to help youth create transformation, enhance ability to understand peers, manage emotions, create greater empathy skills, resolve conflict, improve home environments, maintain positive relationships, as well as reduce suspension rates and improve academic outcomes. Fully funding DYD and Care First will ensure the successful implementation of a restorative model and will reflect the county's commitment to move away from harmful punitive systems. Rather than funding probation, a department that continues to create harm and prove time and time again incapable of providing young people with the basic safety and services fully fund DYD so it can successfully launch this July and meet its goals of transformation and healing. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Aisha Abdallah. You may begin. Hi, my name is Aisha. I'm with um, I'm calling for item 3B, and I'm coming from Supervisory District 2 with Polly Mitchell. And first of all, yeah, I definitely support healthy LA recommendations. Um, but for specifically for 3B, I am definitely would like to highlight the concern um, that I and many community members have about the lack of investment for the community land trust um, in the year's proposed budget. And really, we're asking for the county to expand last year's acquisition and rehab pilot program with community land trust. Um, right now it's set for 9.15 million divided about a half a dozen affordable housing in, uh, organizations and that's just not enough. And we're asking if it could be up to 30 million um, to really cover um, an additional 80 homes from and saving them from the speculative market and you know, talk about preventative measures for um, homelessness prevention of keeping folks in their homes and housed. And, um, of course, again, we're asking for the expansion of this existing program. And we certainly appreciate the dedication of additional funding for the Chapter 8 program. Um, and with that, ensuring that tax defaulted properties are the ones that are prioritized for affordable housing. But of course, we want this pilot program to continue and for it to be named the CLT Community Land Trust Partnership Program as, as it was done last year, really to ensure that these properties will serve the community in perpetuity and that opportunities for resident ownership can of course also be advanced. Um, and then finally, um, we're asking for the final budget to also allocate 10 million to resource a codified right to counsel for low income tenants and particularly unincorporated LA County who may face eviction. and. This codified right would cover the cost for eviction defense and eviction prevention services, including tenant outreach education. Um, we really believe that these funds should be in addition to resources budgeted for countywide services, reaching a limited number of renters for Excuse um, me? a day house delay. Excuse you know, me, just, your resident, time has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? As a reminder to address the board, if you have not already done so, please press one then zero do not press one and zero a second time or you'll be removed from the queue. We will now hear the Spanish interpretation of the reminder. Como recordatorio para dirigirse a las supervisoras, si aún no lo ha hecho, presione uno y luego el cero en este momento. No presione uno y cero por segunda vez porque será eliminado de la fila. Thank you. Next speaker, please. 
Our next participant is Melinda Kakani. You may begin. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, please begin. Great, thanks. This is Melinda Kakani with Children's Defense Fund California. Um, I, I think um, one of the supervisors said something along the lines of it's people who get the work done. And I think it's important to add an asterisk to that because it's unclear what the probation department is getting done outside of wholly consuming our NCC dollars only to be deemed unsuitable for the confinement of youth twice, only to be sued by the attorney general, only to allow for food with maggots to be served to our young people. We can keep pointing to state mandated requirements that somehow require us to spend $409 million to incarcerate something like 400 young people, or we can be creative. We can stop patting ourselves on the back and we can take contracting away from probation. We can take reentry away from probation, not that they do it anyway because they're more focused on surveillance and violations. We can take pre-plea reports out of probation. We can take the funding associated with 400 vacant positions from within probation. Supervisor Mitchell, you said something about getting resources to our residents who need them the most. That doesn't mean the sheriff and probation getting $4.5 billion. Did any one of you listen to what the COC reported about the sheriff and schools in the Antelope Valley in particular? That's nothing short of horrific. That's nothing short of violence. So accountability means you all stay accountable to the intent behind Measure J and what the people who put you all in office voted for. That means funding the Department of Youth Development beyond just transferring YDD's budget over. That means more mental health bed. That means youth centers. That means the countywide infrastructure for youth development so that kids don't get put in cages. That means folks trapped in men's central jail can speak to their loved ones for free. That means we fund families and not foster care. That means prioritizing people and not institutions. At the budget hearing for the recommended budget, nearly every caller called for funding of the Department of Youth Development. You're hearing the same today, so what is it that you all need to do the right thing? To ask the right questions, to push the CEO, to Anthony's point, what's the point of us showing up here? It all feels so performative. It's really easy to say the right Excuse thing. Excuse me? Many of you are experts at that, so step up and Excuse do me, the right thing. Excuse me, your time has expired. Not just for the Can white folks the next speaker, for please? this country was built, but for... Our next participant is Nicole Brown. You may begin. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Nicole Brown at the Urban Peace Institute and the LA's Uprising Coalition. I'm a resident of La Habra Heights in District 4, and I'm calling to urge you to really prioritize your state priorities and make a greater investment um, in our communities. Um, and this includes $150 million for the Department of Youth Development, $900 million to fully fund the Care First Community Investment, $237 million for new mental health beds so we can close Men's Central Jail, and $110 million per year for independent pretrial services. We are excited that the Department of Youth Development will launch on July 1st. This is an important milestone after years of planning. However, this department will not be successful unless we can identify robust and ongoing funding. DUID needs at least $100 million, $150 million, and we are basically getting YED's current budget of $25 million. I appreciate Supervisors Kuehl recognition that youth, youth development is more than just diversion, but we need to get money to the ground to start supporting that immediately. The development fund that we have um, is not ongoing funding, and as the CEO stated, many of the things that we value most are in a structural deficit. The one important and easy way Way to allocate ongoing funding to DYD is by cutting all 412 vacant positions that have sat vacant for years in juvenile probation and represent something like $60 million. We need to get that money to DYD immediately and make sure that it gets youth development services on the ground. Despite an 86% decrease in the number of incarcerated youth in the last 12 years, probation staffing has only grown. In this budget, you will spend over $400 million to incarcerate about 400 young people. That is $1 million per year per youth that could be spent on their potential and their development instead of their trauma. As my colleague said, for two times in less than a year, our halls have been found unsuitable for the confinement of youth by a state board that has never come to that ruling. And for the budget that is allocated to them, we need to try to do something different instead of just... Excuse me, your time has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Genevieve Cleverell. You may begin. Yes, good morning, the Board of Supervisors. Dr. Genevieve Cleverell, you know, it's kind of ironic that you have a budget 
and the people have only two minutes to deal with it and even with the public comment. Uh, it's a budget of 38.5 billion. That's kind of funny. And you go to reopen 538 positions. And more important than opening the position is to reopen the board so we can really talk and see what's going on. I mean, uh, I still have asked the question, how come we have almost $1 billion who have not been utilized, especially on mental health? And I have called the CEO of his, and I called everybody I know, and nobody has given me an answer. So uh, I know for you, uh, a billion is nothing when you're doing studies, but five billion, you know, but um, things need to change, and I think it's uh, time to reopen, and I wish that the budget were not closed and open to the public. So please make it happen. Have a nice week. Talk to you later. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Cheryl Manuel. You may begin. I'm here. Good morning, everyone. Um, as I say, mostly I'm not going to belabor the point. I want to start by giving the Board of Supervisors a feather in their cap. They have to cast a very, very wide net and do a lot with a little. There's only 24 hours in one day. But I'm here on behalf of SAGE, Strategic Actions for a Just Economy. And I kind of echo the sentiments of others. We keep being the hamster on the wheel about the same subject. And it's just daunting that Biden can instantly send billions to Ukraine and we can't take care of our own backyard. So maybe we can get some swift actions on our side, like other programs. That's it, thank you very much. I know your work is hard, so I don't want to, you know, kind of give you a hard time, but these are hard times. Mm -hmm. God bless, see you next meeting. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Roberto Garcia. You may begin. Hello? Hello? Yes, you may begin. Okay. Hi, my name is Roberto. I'm uh, Garcia Ceballos. I'm part of uh, Supervisor District, Hello Salisas uh, uh, district, District 1, and I'm here with uh, Fideicomiso Comunitario Tierra Libre, the first community land trust in Boyle Heights in East LA. And I'm calling to comment on uh, item three and in support of the recommendations for the LA County 2002-2023 fiscal year budget. Um, I'm just, you know, I think community, the work we've been able to do with community land trust has been really important this year. We've been able to preserve um, 43 households, uh, eight buildings, and we really want to be able to continue this work this year. And that's why we recommend that you fund $30 million uh, for us to remove an additional 80 homes from the speculative market um, and continue to fund the Chapter 8 program that uh, is really important now that we're seeing the financial crisis impact, inflation impact homes, we feel that tax foreclosure is really gonna impact our neighborhoods and we really need to preserve um, these homes. And then finally, uh, we would really love, I would really love to see, and our organization and our neighborhood would like to see that $10 million be uh, resourced for codified right to counsel for low income tenants in the unincorporated uh, LA County regions. Uh, you know, we not we don't only stabilize and preserve buildings, but we we want to make sure that we can work with tenants and that they have the right protections to not be evicted during this time. We're still living in COVID. People are still getting sick, and folks need the resources, specifically right to counsel. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Sylvia Maroquin. You may begin. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Sylvia Marroquin. I'm with uh, Strategic Action for Just Economy. Well, um, I see a huge opportunity to make history here. 
I know that a lot of people are being saved right now because we have something that is similar to the right to counsel, only it's not. This is only a program, the State House LA. Um, so giving $10 million is very little, but here's an opportunity for everyone in the, um, in the supervisor's uh, seat to make it uh, to make history and start talking about the right to counsel. We know that this is saving lives in other states, in other cities, and they have approved it. This is LA. LA is usually the vanguard of good changes. So please listen to this great opportunity that you have upon you and before you and make it right. Give the $10 million, which is nothing service that you know this great thing saving lives and uh i like the uh what um uh supervisor q said you know it's raining only it's not people are also dying from this heat exhaustion so uh, we don't want any more uh homeless people dying on the street and this is a great opportunity to stop the evictions um so that, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Good day. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Benny Benitez. You may begin. Hello, my name is Benny Benitez with the Youth Justice Coalition. I'll be speaking on item two and general public comment. We urge the Board of Supervisors to fully fund the Department of Youth Development with $150 million and to fully fund the CARE First budget. The board promised $75 million for the Youth Justice Reimagine, and you are still giving us only Youth Diversion and Development budget. Don't make promises you cannot keep because we will continue to hold you account accountable for that. $25 million is not enough to build a strong Department of Youth Development to provide community-based youth development services and community-based organizations with resources. A starting point can be to reduce the $4.5 billion budget going to the Sheriff and Probation Department, which have done nothing but physically, mentally, and emotionally harm our youth, families, and communities of color. We need to reduce juvenile probation's $570 million budget. This includes cutting all 40 vacant positions in juvenile probation and redirecting that money to the Department of Youth Development. Those positions have sat vacant for years. We don't need them and you're just wasting money. What you need to do is invest in our youth and downside probation now. Thank you. Thank you, may we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Francisco Romero. You may begin. Yes, good morning and thank you. My name is Francisco Romero. I'm calling on behalf of the Park Equity Alliance, member of Promissable Heights. Uh, we wanted to uplift that today we uploaded our comment letter that details our comments for today. We also sent this letter um, over to many of the board supervisors offices on Friday. So wanted to make sure that that was being incorporated into the, into the discussion today. But really the four key points that we wanted to bring up were the institu institutionalization of uh, parks after dark um, versus you know, year to year kind of funding, institutionalizing it from here on out, restoring the Department of Parks and Recreation staffing levels to the recommended levels, which was uh, 1,702 positions. Uh, thirdly, we wanted to uplift the investment into culturally relevant programming and climate related infrastructure in the highest needs community. And finally, we are here in solidarity and, and an, an alliance with uh, fully fund funding the CARE uh, First Community Investments at 900 million annually to invest in the CFCI community center recommendations and commit to a transparent and equitable process. We look forward to continue to uh, working towards all these equity goals and alternatives to incarceration as well. And thank you so much uh, to the Board of Supervisors, particularly uh, Supervisor Solis for, for her continued leadership in this the park equity um, initiatives that we as the Park Equity Alliance have been forwarding, as well as the other uh, offices and Board of Supervisors 
Thank you so much for your continued leadership on this. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Christopher Idge. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. Christopher Idge from the Union of American Physicians and Dentists. We are here uh, today to ask for more funding for overtime so our doctors at the coroner's office can do their jobs in a timely manner. We'll be, we will be reaching out to your offices to address these issues. And um, there will, uh, and we hope that there'll be funding in the budget to address overtime issues, hiring of coroners and retaining them. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Bernadette Golami. You may begin. Hi, good morning, supervisors and community. I'm here to speak on my opposition on uh, item number two, the fiscal budget for 2022-2023 and general public comment. My name is Bernadette Medina Galami and I'm with Public Council's Children's Rights Project and the Los Angeles Youth Uprising. I really just wanna urge the board to fully fund the CARE First budget and this should include $150 million for the Department of Youth Development this year, $900 million um, annually to fully fund the CARE First community investment, $237 million for new mental health beds to close Men's Central Jail, and $110 million per year for independent pretrial services. While we are very excited that the Department of Youth Development will launch on July 1st, it is vital that we get the full funding for the department, which is at least $150 million to realize youth justice reimagined, including funding for community-based youth development services. Um, the board promised 75 million for youth justice reimagined, and unfortunately, we've only been given the 25 million from YDB's budget, and that is not enough. Um, it's not enough to build a strong DYD or provide the community-based organizations with resources. Um, one way that may be able to help is reducing probation's budget, particularly juvenile probation's $570 million budget. Um, there are 350 to 450 vacant positions for the last three years in probation. They should be cut immediately and the associated funding, which is about 60 million, should go to DYD. Similarly, we need to think about priorities. And as we think about priorities, we need to, it is hard to understand how the CEO recommended $410 million to incarcerate 400 young people. This is not investing in our young people. As someone mentioned earlier, this is investing in the trauma and the pain and the hurt of our young people. Um, money should be reallocated, you know, and not going to a flawed system, but instead being invested in youth justice reimagined, being invested in youth development, being invested in the community. And many of these communities don't want police or probation or the sheriffs in their communities. Excuse, excuse me, your time has expired. And we have the next speaker, please. Our next participant is Christian Flagg. You may begin. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, please begin. Yeah, greetings. Uh, my name is Christian Flagg, Director of Training at Community Coalition and also uh, lead support as a partner organization in the Brother Sean Feld Coalition. And I'm calling in today to speak on item two to say uh, that the board needs to fully fund the Department of Youth Development with at least $150 million. I wanna say that when you're working to transform an institution um, that has incarcerated young people for too long, it is important to aggressively allocate the necessary resources and dollars to actually operationalize what needs to happen. You've had uh, some amazing work being done in the Youth Justice Reimagined work group and a lot of community members, young people coming out and telling you uh, exactly what the community has already been doing um, to address the issue and supporting our young people, but the dollars have to go there. So we're calling for money to uh, develop and build out the youth development networks, right? Really uh, giving the money to uh, fortify community-based organizations who are already doing the work, right? Launch and staff the actual department, right? And then lastly, um, funding the YES teams, right? The cred uh, credible messengers and the services to support with reentry. Um, again, I just want to reiterate, we cannot transform and create the necessary 
uh, infrastructure without putting the dollars there. All right, so fully fund the Department of Youth Development with $150 million and continue to grow those, um, that investment and allocation if you're going to truly address uh, youth development across L.A. County. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Lupe Viejas. You may begin. Lupe Villegas, yep. your line's open, yeah. go ahead. Hi, good morning, my name is Lupe Villegas. I am a member of SAGE nonprofit organization, an organization that helps out tenants when they're being evicted and tenants knowing their rights. I am here and talking about matter 3B. We're asking for 10 million of permanent support. I am a single mom, 29 years old. I've been homeless for three years old. My kids been removed from me for the department. Now I am being harassed, discriminated, neglected from my landlord, not trying to do the repairs. I have two kids, the sink stinks, and it's really bad for their health. He doesn't come as an urgent. He comes whenever he wants to. My kids been sick with asthma. I've been sick with asthma right now with the COVID. Those are really bad symptoms to have. You could get COVID right away. I ask him for support and the tenant's right to cancel. Um, he is right now trying to evict me, and I can barely afford my rent in a low budget. I don't have a full-time job that can replace me or that I could have any savings. I've just been really with COVID, so I don't have a lot of savings, and I wouldn't be able to support myself if I were to be in court and get a lawyer. I don't have money to put out of my pocket in order to get some help if I were to get a court, so I'm asking for some help. I don't want, I want to lose a home. I want a home for my kids and I'm trying my best. I am asking please to get some help for right to counsel. I would love to get somebody to represent me that I don't have to budge out of my pocket too much to pay for a right to counsel. I feel that this is injustice. It is an eviction that is not valid. I am working, paying my rent on time. And it's just because his constant plumbing issues that I am calling him about the landlord doesn't want to take attention. I don't feel it's my issue that is a uh, material that is part of his building. Excuse me, your time Madam has expired. Chair, could we refer her to uh, our consumer and business affairs? Yeah, office? that's what I was gonna say. Okay, yeah, so we could we could do that. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Alexia Sina. You may begin. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes, please begin. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Alexia Sina, and I am with the Anti-Recidivism Coalition. I want to speak on agenda item number two and general public comment. I want to urge the board to fully fund the Department of Youth Development with $150 million and to fully fund the CARE FIRST budget. 25 million is not enough to build a strong department and, a, and provide it with resources compared to probation's $570 million budget. Last year, we spent over 1 million per youth. Instead of investing into youth incarceration, I urge the board to invest in our youth's future. These youth deserve to be cared for and given the resources and tools they need for reentry inside and out credible messengers inside to mentor them and to show them examples of change, hope and redemption and resources like youth centers, housing and CBOs when they re-enter society. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Leah Zeidler Ordaz. You may begin. Good morning. This is Leah Zeidler Ordaz with UCLA Law's Criminal Justice Program. I'm calling on the board to follow through on its care first promise and fully fund the Department of Youth Development. We're standing up DYD at the end of this week and subsuming YDD's $25 million budget into the new department is not enough to fully realize the vision of youth justice reimagined. DYD needs at least 150 million this year to begin the process of building youth development networks and four spas to launch and staff DYD 
to pay for the YES Team pilot, place credible messengers in facilities, and fund community-based reentry services, and fund new youth centers and housing. Compare that to spending over $1 million to incarcerate one youth in camps and halls that has been declared unsuitable by the BSCC. The community is tired of hearing, sorry, we can't fund all these amazing YJR programs because we are overfunding the failing, crumbling mess that is the probation department. It's all about what the board is choosing to prioritize. As Supervisor Mitchell has said, prioritize the priority. BYD is the priority. Our youth are the future, and we need to ensure their health, safety, and well-being. Fund the new DOID. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Miguel Cesar. You may begin. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Miguel Cazar, and I'm calling in um, as somebody who's very concerned by the the, the the values that this budget espouses. I think that from a moral perspective, this county's budget is an ethical disaster. It continues to uphold institutions that have been shown to trample upon the rights of people and those most marginalized. They failed completely to address any of the violations that have been found by their own evaluations, let alone the decades of testimony that we have from those most impacted. And it also reflects a very twisted set of punitive logics that contradict what all of you have promised publicly to support. As a researcher and as from a logical perspective, this budget is only destined to worsen life and safety and justice for people in Los Angeles. It is impossible to think that we continue to make decisions based on flawed logics that only pander to political in interests and the disregard, the effort, the movement, the testimony, the research, um, and everything that makes sense, um, I, I just don't understand why we continue to find ourselves in this situation. And I really urge this board to have some courage, to take leadership, um, to fund the Department of Youth Development, to confront these political organizations that are wreaking havoc and are organizing people to uphold their own legitimacy as they continue to, to reenact violence and to perpetuate harm um, and to worsen the, the injustices that those most impacted continue to face in our community. Thank you. Thank you very much. We exceeded um, actually our 40 minutes that was allocated for public speakers. And so we'd like to thank all of those who called in to speak. If you were unable to provide your comments, you may submit written comments as indicated agenda and we'll continue to accept all written comments that come in during the meeting which will become part of the record again thanks to all of the callers who took the time to read and understand the budget um, and called in to share their perspective we're going to begin now colleagues with our um, deliberations we'll hear from our chief executive officer Fiji Davenport on item one once again, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, as you mentioned, starting with agenda item number one, fiscal year 21-22 budget issues. This letter reflects our second mid-year appropriation and budget adjustment board letter, commonly known as the second mid-year BA. This letter recommends a variety of changes, which we also call adjustments, to the operating and or capital budgets referenced in the letter. These budgets were approved by your board on October 4th, 2021, when the board adopted the fiscal year 21-22 final adopted budget. By adopting the recommendations in this board letter, the board will authorize changes to the operating and capital budgets referenced in the letter so that the budgets align with transactions that have occurred since the time of their, ado since the time of their adoption on October 4th. In adopting the budget letter, the board would also make necessary findings related to the California Environmental Quality Act. So item number one, the fiscal year 21-22 second mid-year budget adjustment recommendations are before you. Thank you. Any questions from supervisors? 
Okay, seeing none, item one is before us. Moved by Supervisor Kuehl, super, seconded by Supervisor Solis. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item one is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. We'll now hear from the Chief Executive Officer on item number two. Thank you, Madam Chair. Agenda item number two, fiscal year 22-23 budget items. This agenda item is comprised of two items on the agenda, 2A and 2B. Item 2A is a report of issues raised at the public budget hearings, which were held on May 11, 2022. The report summarizes issues raised at the hearings by both oral and written testimony, including the individual supervisors and departmental requests for additional funding for various programs. This report is a receive and file. Item 2B is a board letter representing my recommendations for adjustments to the fiscal year 22-23 recommended budget, which your board adopted on April 19th, 2022. This agenda item is comprised of six recommendations that I'll uh, summarize briefly. The first recommendation seeks a finding that the proposed capital project actions referenced in the letter are not projects within the meaning of the California Environmental Quality Act based on the record of proposed activities. The second recommendation requests that the board adopt the proposed changes to the fiscal year 22-23 recommended county budget as set forth in the board letter and the attachments to the letter. The third recommendation requests that the board reallocate $1.5 million in funding from one care first and community investment program to another. Specifically, the letter seeks to repurpose the use of this funding, which was approved by your board on August 22nd, 2022, from the fiscal and online resource hubs for youth to programming at existing youth centers as more specifically described in the letter. The fourth, fifth, and sixth recommendations are similar in that they seek delegated authority related to funding agreements. Specifically, the letter seeks authorization for me or my designee for the Director of Economic Development or her designee and for the Director of the Executive Office or her designee respectively to execute, amend if necessary, or terminate funding agreements in the amount stated and for the purposes specified for a variety of programs included in this budget letter. So item 2A consisting of the receive and file and item 2B consisting of six uh, recommendations related to the fiscal year 22-23 budget that I just summarized are before you. Thank you. Questions or remarks from co my colleagues? Seeing none, we're going to take uh, one vote on items 2A and 2B together. So 2A and 2B are before us. Moved by Supervisor Mitchell, seconded by Supervisor Hahn. Executive Officer, will you call the roll, please? Item 2A and 2B are before you. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. Moving on to item three, which are items from previous meetings, which were deferred to the budget deliberations. Ms. Davenport. Thank you, Madam Chair. Agenda item number three is comprised of three reports back deferred to budget deliberations. The three report topics are as follows. Item 3A is a report from our Director of Beaches and Harbors, uh, Mr. Gary Jones, and provides information regarding additional revenue from Marina leasehold extensions. This is an annual report and the additional revenue this year is $394,225. Item 3B is a report from my office regarding the affordable housing budget unit for fiscal year 22-23. 
The report confirms that my office has identified $100 million for affordable housing programming and provides the recommendations for the allocation of that funding as developed by the Affordable Housing Coordinating Committee. And item number 3C is the report back on meeting the sheriff's obligations under Senate Bill 1421. Senate Bill 1421 became effective on January 19th, 2019 and made certain categories of peace officer personnel records available to the public under the California Public Records Act. On March 15th, 2022, your board adopted an ordinance requiring both the sheriff and probation departments to proactively post those records subject to disclosure under SB 1421. The ordinance also requires the department to post within 30 days of a records creation, record subject to another law, Assembly Bill 748, uh, which is a law governing audio and video recordings of a use of force resulting in death or great bodily injury, to post those records within 30 days of the records creation. The report back recommends a multi-departmental staffing plan for county council, the sheriff and probation to meet the requirements of these new laws and obligations with county council playing a key role in moving this work forward. This concludes all the items for agenda item three. All reports are received and filed and are now before you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Davenport. I, I do have one concern with regard to the affordable housing budget report. Um, while I um, absolutely support the funding allocation to preservation strategies, I know that all of us have uh, NOFA developments in process, in construction, about to begin throughout the county and all of our districts. And I know that a number of them are experiencing challenges as a result of increased costs um, in um, financing, particularly with the new increase in interest rates. So I think it would be really helpful um, if you could provide the board with recommendations on a funding gap fund for no for projects to really make sure that these developments that have already been approved that are in progress um, actually get completed with these new developments with regard to rising interest rates. Thank you, Supervisor. We will uh, take that under consideration. Uh, the affordable housing, um, the uh, committee is made up of several departments, including LACDA, uh, folks from my office, the Homeless Initiative. So we will put our heads together and come back uh, to the board um, and to your office with a recommendation. We appreciate that. I'm, I'm sure my colleagues may be getting the same panicked calls that we're getting from projects that are in process that are looking at this increase in interest rate and they're panicked that they're not gonna be able to bring them to fruition, so thank you. Any other comments or remarks from um, board members? Seeing none, items 3A through 3C are before us. Moved by Supervisor Barger, seconded by Supervisor Solis. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item 3A, 3B, and 3C are before you. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuhl. Aye. Supervisor Kuhl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Item four, budget items, Ms. Davenport. Thank you, Madam Chair. Agenda item number four is comprised of three recommendations in items 4A, 4B, and 4C. Item 4A is a recommendation. Uh, it's a twofold recommendation, actually. Uh, the first is to modify the appropriations limit resolution for fiscal year 2122. And then the second is to approve the appropriations limit and the appropriations subject to limit for fiscal year 22-23. Each year, my office calculates the county's appropriations limit and the board adopts a resolution to approve that limit. That limit must be reviewed as part of an annual financial audit. In preparation for our annual review with our external auditors, my office found an exception 
and which the adopted fiscal year 21-22 appropriations limit resolution included an error. So my office has recalculated the limit for fiscal year 21-22 and now asked the board to adopt the corrected and modified limit as specified in the letter. We also seek approval of the appropriations limit for fiscal year 22-23 as set forth in the board letter. Item 4B um, is a recommendation that your board would approve if there were revised figures for the fiscal year 22-23 final changes budget. Um, to the extent that your board has adopted uh, the final changes budget recommendations under item 2B of today's agenda, there is no need to take action on item 4B today. Okay. Lastly, item 4C is a recommendation that your board approve nine miscellaneous items consisting of a series of delegated authority requests or instructions to departments that we seek each year to operationalize the budget. More specifically, items one through four and nine seek authority to enter into and or approve agreements on the terms set forth in the board letter. Item number five seeks approval of budgetary accounting policies. Items six and seven seek delegated authority to my office to approve the transfers of appropriation as set forth in state budget law. And finally, item number eight seeks approval of temporary transfers of positions among departments based on a condition set forth in this letter. This concludes the agenda items for item number four. And so item 4A and item 4C are before you. Thank you very much for that clarification. Any questions or remarks on items 4A and 4C from my colleagues? See, so, Madam uh, Chair, so we're not so we're not voting on 4B. Correct. No okay. Correct. Correct. That was the clarif clarification made by the CEO. We're only taking up items 4A and 4C. Seeing no further questions, items 4A and 4C are before us. Moved by Supervisor Hahn, seconded by Supervisor Barger, Executive Officer. Please call the roll. 4A and 4C are before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuhl. Aye. Supervisor Kuhl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you very much. It's my understanding that item five will be presented by our auditor controller, um, Arlene Barrera. Are you with us? Yes, good afternoon, Supervisors. Arlene Barrera, Auditor Controller. On April 19th, your board approved the fiscal year 2022-23 recommended budget. We have updated all the adjustments your board approved in your discussion earlier today, and the fiscal year 2022-23 final budget is balanced and is now ready for your consideration. Ms. Barrera, thank you very much. Are there questions members have? of item five. Seeing none, item five is before us. Moved by Mitchell, seconded by Kuhl, executive officer, please call the roll. Item five is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuhl. Aye. Supervisor Kuhl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you all. Um, happy Monday. This concludes today's meeting. Our next regularly scheduled meeting of the board will be held tomorrow, Tuesday, June, June 28, 2022, at 9.30 a.m. The special meeting for the fiscal year 22-23 budget deliberation is adjourned. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you.